just pulling up the uh, thing on my phone. The camera should be live in just a minute. Yeah, here we go. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to my game engine development stream. Um, we are listening to the uh, sessions once again. One of my favorite coding uh, uh, playlists. Um, but yeah, uh, yesterday we got started on the inspector for the scene. So uh, in previous streams, <clears throat> in previous streams we set up uh, the ability to load a scene file into the editor to display it and to be able to control the camera inside of the scene view um, and to be able to select and do multi-select items. Um, now, uh, the, yesterday we, we, we got most of the way to a functional, at least minimum viable product functional um, inspector with the transforms. Basically, we would take the items that we had selected. Um, if the items shared a value, then you could set them all simultaneously. So for example, if I select sprites one, two, and three, I mean, they all say sprite one, two, three, one, two, three, but the first three in the list, um, the X position will say not a number, um, even, though, even though that's only a stand-in right now for um, dashes or something to indicate that their values are not in common. Um, but everything else is identical. Their scale, their the Y position, and their Z position. Uh, and if we were to drag on one of these, we can change those items, um, which is nice. Um, if I was to type in a number here, then the uh, it would set the uh, transform of all of them to be the same on that axis. Uh, I don't have the ability to undo quite yet, so I'm just going to do a file open scene to refresh the scene. Um, and because these are all unique, uniquely identified sprites, um, loading the scene file again will reload their previous positions, but not duplicate them. You can still see we have the same number of sprites in the list. Um, and we left off uh, with a interesting problem with uh, sprite rotation or entity rotation, I suppose, because uh, these are these things that we're working on apply to any objects in the scene, um, sprites or models or what have you. Um, so where we left off, we were having some trouble with the rotation and you can see it popping in here again. Um, the uh, I, it took me a, a, just a tiny little bit of searching today, but I, uh, I've realized that um, there was an issue arising from the fact that I was converting uh, from uh, radiance to degrees, but then not back from degrees to radiance. Um, so yesterday we had a, an example where instead of going crazy spinning like that, it would like rapidly go back to zero. Um, but basically I was just forgetting to convert um, bi-directionally. Uh, but it does bring into focus the larger problem that we spotted before we tried to convert from degrees to, from de degrees to radians. Um, so let me take a look at that now. Um, with rotation, we got the uh, X, Y, and Z rotations, um, equivalent to roll, pitch, and yaw. So the idea is that, um, well, equivalent to uh, pitch, uh, yaw, and roll in, in that order. So basically, um, whenever you change the uh, degree of uh, rotation, uh, it goes counterclockwise if you're looking down the positive axis of that, or the positive direction of that axis. So for example, in the uh, uh, X rotation, uh, we see that it's rotating the pitch. It's the, the coordinate system here is that uh, X is off to the off to the left and right, Y is up and down, and, and Z is forward and back. Um, the right direction is uh, positive, the up direction is positive, and the forward direction is positive. Um, so if we imagine the axis going out, uh, hi Joel, uh, welcome in, thanks for lurking. If we imagine the positive axis going off that way, uh, when we look down it, 
Um, the way that rotations work is that as you go positive, you go counterclockwise when looking that direction. Um, and the same thing goes for the other axes as well. Um, if we go to, uh, I'm gonna get a watermelon from the store here back. Nice. Yeah, it's a good day for watermelon. It's always a good day for watermelon. Um, if we take a look at the uh, Z direction here, um, we are looking forward down the positive direction of the Z axis and the same deal, it rotates counterclockwise as you go positive. Um, now there's a bit of a problem here with yaw in this case. So at, at a certain point, if I go too big or too small, um, the sprite starts freaking out. Um, and it's, it's actually a larger problem than it seems. So um, if we take a look at what's happening uh, at these inflection points, we actually have the uh, other two axes flipping back and forth between zero and negative 180 degrees. And this occurs um, both when you are um, both when you are uh, near 90 degrees and when you're near negative 90 degrees on the y-axis. Hey, what's up? How is it going? Um, yeah, so this problem, it took me a little bit to kind of figure out what's happening here. Um, this problem arises from gimbal lock um, in, a, in a sense. There's actually multiple Euler angles that can produce this one rotation. So I guess it's the uh, kind of the opposite of gimbal lock. Um, gimbal lock is the sense that if you have uh, two axes uh, uh, aligned with each other, uh, then you lose a degree of freedom. Um, in, in this sense, it's that um, a, at two orientations, uh, the output is the same. Um, so we are in, in the code, when we go to make a change here, we are translating from the internal Euler represent, or sorry, the internal quaternion representation to Euler angles for the sake of the editor. And then we are translating back from them to Euler angles internally. And that works fine for the first two axes that, that applies the roll and the uh, pitch. Um, and you can see that as I go around the circle, it kind of smoothly just keeps going like that. Um, even though the number appears to wrap around inside of the inspector, it goes to a po positive 180 and then it goes to negative 180. And it smoothly allows me to, to spin around this axis uh, as long as I feel like. And that's great. Um, that is uh, expected behavior. Um, just rewriting my version of STD vector for the third time. <laughs> yeah, be careful you don't get too hung up on it. Um, the because like you can you can uh, get some real performance benefits out of having your own, but nowadays modern compilers with the standard library are actually pretty vast. Um, I tend to prefer just to use um, what I have at hand until I have a solid reason to move over. It's still too hot. Um, but yeah, so when I reach negative 90 and positive 90 on the uh, y-axis, which is uh, your yaw, um, so camera, camera terms, roll is this on the z-axis, uh, pitch is this on the x-axis, and then yaw is uh, this on the, I don't know if my hands are in the frame, uh, roll, uh, pitch, and yaw is on, on the y-axis going like this. Um, Oftentimes, uh, you you would do roll first, then pitch, then yaw. Um, I don't think that's the order that uh, GLM's uh, uh, Euler angles mathematics does. I think uh, what it does is it um, it applies the. Well, I guess we can experiment and double check. Um, I think what it does is that it applies the pitch uh, last and the roll first. Um, that's my hunch. Because, like, if you take a look at this, um, if we set the uh, roll to 15 degrees, and then we go to rotate the pitch um, to 90 degrees, 
it uh, actually still tilted relative to the camera. Um, so pitch is being applied uh, second. Yeah, I don't concern myself with standard library performance. They are really good already. I just want to avoid exceptions and you pass call case. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, though, regarding exceptions and uh, um, STD vector, I think that um, you could, like, if you just use the standard library version, aren't you still able to turn off exceptions? Because the exceptions that they throw uh, can all be unhandled, right? And then you would just, like, they, they just arise from misuse of, uh, SD, of STD vector, and then uh, the uh, misuse will cause crashes, which is what you want. If I'm remembering right, I've never bothered to turn off exceptions, and I don't have the option in my in my engine um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I suppose you have to go into all the methods to to get all their exceptions, but <laughs> um, yeah. Returning back to this, um, it appears that. Roll, apply, roll is applied first, and then, yeah, and then uh, yaw, and then pitch. And that's, you know, I, I don't think I like that very much. I prefer, um, it's a lot more intuitive for for folks to apply uh, uh, roll, pitch, then yaw. Um, so I might, I might want to go and change the order on that. Um, but uh, the problem kind of still arises with this, no matter what you do. Because when I go to convert uh, from the degrees that the user inputs into the editor, um, the Euler angles, there's going to be this problem, no matter how you uh, calculate from to and from Euler angles. There's gonna be a problem where there's ambiguity in between what you enter in here and what you get out. Um, so what's happening here is that when I get to the positive and negative 90 degrees, there's actually two different orientations that can cause this. Um, and so uh, when I convert to and from, uh, rounding errors in the floating point, I believe, are leading to a situation where the uh, other two degrees of freedom are flicking back and forth between the two adjacent possibilities. So um, to put this another way, uh, setting that back to zero, if we were to uh, completely 180 degree flip the vertical, and then on that, that is we flip um, doing a pitch on the x-axis, and then we do 180 degrees on the rotation, uh, and then we go to flick back and forth between the 90s, the, these are equivalent. Like you can, having Madeline be uh, forward and, and backward, um, you can represent that those two different ways, and that's and that's where the flickering uh, is coming from. So uh, let's take a look at Unity. Um, I I, t I did poke around in Unity uh, uh, yesterday after the stream because I was curious about how they represented things. Um, in Unity, we had. Uh, observed that it allows you to input degrees that are far greater than 180 degrees. It just kind of just keeps increasing, and uh, that's kind of the way that most um, that most uh, game engines work as well. But I happen to know that under the hood, uh, Unity uses quaternions to do all of its uh, transformations, and that's a pretty common practice in game engines as to. Um, have the internal representation be quaternions and then do all the math uh the 3d math using quaternions um, and then for the user experience side on the editor they'll translate that into euler angles and then vice versa um so my question was how is it possible that you can go beyond 180 degrees on any given axis of freedom because uh Coming back to this example, the second you do, you can just subtract 180 degrees and it'll, or sorry, subtract 360 degrees and it'll be an identical transformation. So you, you don't really have the information when you're going to and from uh, the 
quaternion representation to say, okay, the user actually put in 190 degrees positive instead of uh, negative 170. Um, and it actually turns out that this, that the, uh, at least in the Unity uh, editor, they store two different rotation values inside of the scene file. Um, and in 10 years, when the <laughs> Unity editor finally opens, I'll be able to show it. <laughs> My goal is to remove dependency on SDL gradually. SDD array and SD vector seem like a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, those are the most intuitive containers to understand um, when you're first learning the SDL. <laughs> yeah, the... Um, I, I do get a kick out of like understanding like how a lot of this stuff works at the lowest levels, but I've kind of reached a point where I'm like, um, for, th for fundamental things, uh, I think I'm a lot more comfortable uh, going to libraries than I used to be. Um, so like in the old days when I first was getting into game, game engine dev, I probably wouldn't have been comfortable using I am GUI. I probably would have wanted to roll my own UI. And I just would have been a whole bunch of time spent doing that instead of doing my game engine. But you can still learn quite a few things by doing it yourself. Which is why I'm still doing a game engine. Uh, but anyway, back back to uh, Unity. Um, back to Unity. Yep, there goes gravity. Um, yeah. Is it worth it to do unlimited degree rotation? I mean, just let it wrap. It seems uh, less work and more intuitive. Well, it you could you could say so. Um, however, I think that this problem with uh, oops, I've got the wrong sprite selected. Here we go. Um, this problem with the uh, rotation getting stuck because it's flipping back and forth between two orientations. That's a, a solid example as to why you can't simply. Uh, do a translation to and from um, degrees to uh, quaternions. Because what's happening here is that it's translating to two quaternions in the internal representation. And then when that translates back, it comes back as uh, the opposite, uh, the opposite but equal orientation. Um, so these are flipping from zero to 180. And uh, this is flipping between, um, I think it's like, no, I think this this one remains the same. Negative, yeah. So you see, like these this blurry image that just appeared. This is the uh, other two axes flipping between zero and one hundred eighty. So for that practical reason, you kind of have to uh, do that uh, because there's no there's no way I can uh, just take and rotate this continuously in a circle um, with this arrangement. Um, so I have to I have to store more state than uh, just the one representation of the rotation. Um, and I, I was I, I was thinking, well, like like when I had that realization that like um, my one rotation value was not enough, I, I went into Unity to see how they did it because I was like, surely that's not how they do it. But that is actually how they do it, it turns out. Uh, so this is the this is a simple little animated flower and a little animated scene. Um, if I press the play button, it animates and does wind wind stuff, um, which is kind of fun. Um, but the if, if we take a look at the rotation, um, right now it's rotated at 60 degrees. Um, if I if I continually rotate like this, uh, we can just go up and up and up and up until you can see that I'm already at you know over a thousand degrees rotation, um, and I. I was always confused about this, uh, about why it allows you to do that. Like, why wouldn't it just wrap around for you, right? Um, and I think I think now that the, that I've tried I've tried doing this myself. I think now that the main reason why they allow you to do this uh, is they want to um, completely separate uh, the concern of setting the rotation from the concern of. Uh, uh, setting up the quaternion in the engine layer. 
So what what happens here, surely, because I know that this is uh, stored inside of the engine layer, um, is that as I go up and up and up, uh, this is stored in the internal editor representation of the rotation. Um, but under the, under the hood, in order for this to actually rotate in 3D space like we see it, uh, that gets translated into the quaternion, uh, which it which itself does wrap around. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't have any uh, numbers spiraling to forever. Um, and if we take a look at the representation in the scene file, um, and I had it open a little while ago. Uh, da -da -da -da. That would be on my studio drive with the software and the um, uh, Unity practice project. Uh, if we go into assets and scenes, uh, and then this is the testing test win system scene. This guy. Uh, so this is the actual scene file. If I go to uh, open that up in a text editor, um, which if you didn't know, uh, all, all, um, almost all of the files that you work with in a game engine are text files because they source control very well. Um, and then I look for the this flower in question, which is flower underscore one five. Flower. Ah, if I can type today, flower underscore one five. Okay, here it is. Um, so we've got the game object uh, which is contains the uh, representation of the game object, um, tells us which components are attached to it. Um, and then if we scroll down, we see the uh, transform that's been applied to it. Um, and then, and we have a few things. We have the local rotation, which is a, which is a quaternion. We have the local position, which is you know the X Y Z, um, and all this stuff that you expect. This is the internal representation, I think, in three D. Um, however, there's also uh, a thing called a hint um, that I saw. I'm trying to find it. Euler angles hint. Um, and actually, I think I might have deleted the the one uh, earlier, and it didn't recreate. Let me save the file real quick. Um, so I'll undo my changes. Uh, yeah, like that. Save, um, and then heading back into here. Go to hint. Here we go. Uh, where's the flower five clump? This is flower flower one five. <laughs> I, I I did a whole bunch of duplications without bothering to. Okay. Um, so this is the the same transform. Um, the we have the local rotation position and scale. Um, oh, okay, there it is. Yeah, my, my editor had saved a change where I had removed it, and I guess it didn't repopulate. Um, but the Euler uh, hint. Undo. There we go. Yeah. So we have this thing: local Euler angles hint. Uh, this just shows the Euler angles that appear in the editor: zero, sixty, zero. Um, so we have this kind of this this interesting uh, split. We have stored in the scene file both the the Euler angles in you know, the uh, roll Petunia, and then we have the uh, rotation, which is actually the quaternion that we use internally. Um, and I think the main reason why they do this, um, yeah, let's reload the scene. Um, I think the main reason why they do this is to prevent that problem we were dealing with. If I was to set this to instead of instead of 60 degrees, if I was to add um, 360 degrees to it, so let's make this 420. Hey, oh, um, or it'd be 320, or yeah, be 420. Um, that rotation is identical under the hood. If I was to save this file now and come back. Um, and then I guess reload the file because it doesn't uh, seem to be one, one update. Here we go. Uh, we can see that the, the, the local rotation is essentially the same. Um, this is the negative 0 .5, 0 0.49999 instead of 0.5, whatever, but uh, this is just different only due to rounding point errors. But the Euler angles hint now says 420 instead of 60. 
helpful. So I think this is the way to go. I think that um, we're going to need to implement a system that uh, tracks changes to the Euler layer on our side, and then up only updates the Euler, la Euler layer on our side uh, if and when the Quaternion is programmatically modified um, from the game code or from a from a system code. Um, I wonder if I could. I wonder if I do physics on one of these, how that affects the rotation. I'm gonna do another experiment. Um, so let's uh, duplicate this guy. Um, I'm gonna give this rock. I'll give this rocks some collision, um, and then physics. Um, so we give it a rigid body. Uh, Da, 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 mass one drag whatever uh, uses gravity it's not kinematic interpolate um, no no interpolation collision is discrete constraints info let's constrain the position on the X Y no let's not bother with that um, and then I need uh, I need a collider. I think you can just do, I haven't done physics in Unity in a long time, but if I'm remembering correctly, you just apply a physics body without gravity, um, and so on. Uh, I think I'd, I'm supposed to add a collider to this, um, but I'm not 100% clear on that. Yeah, um, so let's add that. Um, and we'll do a mesh collider. Um, just to keep things simple, I'll just use the the uh, mesh that the mesh itself has. And I'll just use the mesh plane on the on the uh, ground as well. It's still falling through. Yeah, I'm not really 100% clear on why that's happening. Non-convex mesh collider with non-kinematic rigid body is no longer supported. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm going to have to change all right, so on the mesh collider here, we're going to say convex. Um, and then on this, we'll say convex as well. Okay, there we go. Um, so the, re the reason why I'm doing this little experiment um, is because I want to see uh, how the rotation of the object responds. Um, so I'm going to start and start over again. Um, so that rotation remains, you know, tightly within that range. It doesn't rotate very much at all. I'm now going to, on the rotation, uh, set the Z rotation uh, to be, let's make it 380. Um, and then I'd like to see whether the rotation uh, clamps back within uh, the negative 180 to positive 180 range, like I suspect it will. Wow, that's interesting. Hang on. The rotation on it didn't go 180 degrees off. It just... Yeah, it started at 378. It just kind of subtracted. That's weird, isn't it? So actually, it's not just as simple as the uh, Euler layer is being 
uh, repopulated by a translation from the uh... whoops it's not not as simple as it just being um, uh, translated to and from uh, you can see that these rotation values are actually remaining in the same range that they were uh, prior to being affected by physics. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of that. Um, what, what that suggests to me is that the transformation that's being applied to the entity here is also being applied to the Euler um, representation inside of the scene file. which is kind of bizarre to me. A huge amount of, <laughs> a huge amount of this stream, I think is gonna be studying other examples. Um, so this is, that's bizarre. What do you think? Do you think you, um, have an idea as to why the rotation range doesn't just flip back into uh, uh, some reasonable degree of uh, rotation when the game code is updating the rotation. My immediate assumption was that the rotation would uh, just flip back into the range as soon as the game code went to update it because the game code internal representation is used for the physics and then the physics uh, translated back into the Euler angles, you would think that would result in a rotation that uh, was clamped to the same 360 degrees um, on any given axis. Uh, but it, it kind of looks like the representation here um, is sticking to the same range as uh, before and I can't think of a good reason why that would be. Uh, let me uh, start making a list, <laughs> as I do when I uh, am not sure. Um, so the first would be, the first possibility of what's going on here is that perhaps the uh, rotation of the entity, um, the Euler and uh, Quaternion uh, values are being updated in parallel. Uh, by this I mean that uh, when the transformation applies to the quaternion layer, uh, it doesn't just translate from that to this rotation layer. Yeah, it's a, it's a confusing problem. And this is, a, this is a layer of Unity that probably most Unity developers haven't thought about. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, I'm I'm sufficiently confused that I think I I would very much like if I could just find the answer on the internet. Um, I'll try searching for it in a minute, but um, first, just a brainstorm. Um, Euler and Quaternion values being updated in parallel. I don't I don't like this idea very much if this is what they're doing, because it can lead to discrepancies between the uh, rotation uh, represented here and the Quaternion. Um, if for no other thing, no other reason than uh, floating point rounding errors, right? Um, is that you can have, uh, as you're applying these transformations to the Euler and the Quaternions separately, their equivalencies would kind of diverge. Like you translate from one to the other, they no longer equal each other. That, that's my, that's how I would think. Um, another possibility is that uh, Unity tracks the range, or which range, uh, the Euler angles are in, then adds the circle back. Maybe they both have an abstract type that both, maybe they have an abstract type that store both quaternion and degree and alpha operators that change both of them separately. Um, yeah, you can, you can go away, Mr. Bot two one three seven something or other. Let me uh, let me 
take care of that guy real quick. One three seven T Y Q. There we go. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the the question though that you had, maybe they have an abstract data type that stores both quaternion and the degree, um, and changes them independently. That kind of is sidestepping the problem though, um, because the bottom line is is that the uh, inside of the inside of unity the thing that you're actually seeing on the screen the actual 3d graphics that's not calculated with the euler rotation it is calculated with the quaternion um that's the quote unquote single source of, source of truth um so when we go to uh if if it, if it was updating those um independently then we wouldn't be seeing a change here in the editor um the uh it is it the gravity and the and the physics that's being applied. And I'll um, do a little. Uh, let me let me try. Uh, yeah, there we go. Like as we see uh, the thing the thing update. Um, this value here is supposed to represent what we have in the editor live. Um, so it is it 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 has to be updating both simultaneously from the code. Um, container types notwithstanding. So the problem, this, the problem is still how does this value update um, in response to game code or physics code updating the quaternion? Um, it is possible that they're being updated in parallel, but I, I think that that would be kind of unstable. Um, you would think. Because it would—it's possible for the um, quite, for over time uh, for the Euler angles to diverge significantly from the quaternions, um, but it, it is a possibility. Um, this this possibility here, Unity tracking which range the Euler angles in are in—that's um, I think that maybe might be more likely. I'm on the fence as to as to that um let me restart the physics um because i had to knock the rock all, all the way over there um so <laughs> you brought some massive balls home <laughs> nice yeah in uh yeah, in American slang, melons is slang for um, breasts, not balls. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it, I don't know if you guys are dealing with heat waves the way that we are. Um, a lot of places are dealing with heat waves. I see they just keep the Euler range and add some offset to convert from the quaternion. Yeah, that, that's my guess. That's the... That's the... That's... The, there's only two, the two possibilities I can think of as to why this behavior exists. Um, is that they're being updated in a parallel or um, Unity is doing some extra work to keep the range within the values that was set, were set by the artist. Um, but, you know, like I, I feel like that's also... I, I can't imagine them saying that, that it's worth the work to do that, right? Because, like... It's not like an artist is going to say, uh, going to come back after somebody ran a physics simulation on their, on their, on their assets or a level designer, let's say, um, a level designer places an asset. They place the rotation in a range that's greater than 360. And then they come back a few days later and they're just like, Hey, who subtracted 360 degrees from my rotation? Like, I don't think anybody's going to say that. Um, so it doesn't feel like that would have been worth the work. Um, but I'm curious now whether anybody on the internet has um, already asked this question. Scripting API transformed at Euler angles. Um, that's probably not helpful. Uh, Unity, okay, so when you read the Euler.angles property, Unity converts the quaternion's internal representation to Euler angles because there's more than one, 
Because there's more than one way to represent any given rotation, using Euler equals the values you read back may be quite different to the values you assigned. This can cause confusion. Um, to avoid these, the recommended way to work with rotations is to avoid relying on consistent results when reading Euler angles, particularly when attempting to gradually increment the a roto rotation to produce an animation. Uh, yeah, and you, you, you want to use quaternions for... Another reason why quaternions are great is because you can interpolate them a lot, but a lot easier. Um, but... I'm not even sure how to phrase the things that I'm trying to ask. <laughs> This might be a question that um, this might be a question that nobody has asked. <laughs> uh, how to express and verify oil or rotation limits on Unity? I need some way to set min and max angles for each Euler component, and check whether the transform dot local Euler angles falls within those limits. This is probably unrelated. It's probably dealing with a cap, um, like degrees of motion um, within the full range. Euler angles aren't necessarily a good way of expressing limits over arbitrary ranges, as their behavior close to zero is different from their behavior away from zero. Uh, da, 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 da. And yet, when we look at the range of orientations allowed, we see all that uh, blah 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 blah. So, limits specified in Euler angles are error prone. Yeah, this is unrelated. Yeah, okay. I guess we're gonna have to have a play a, have to have play a guessing game um, as to the actual reason for this. Um, it's maybe if I was to ask this on Reddit or something, somebody would uh, know the answer. Um, but. For our purposes, I think it's sufficient to know that the uh, game code uh, representation, the quaternion representation, is the single source of truth, and we translate from that back to the editor at some later point. Um, I think for my first implementation, uh, I will I will do uh, a scenario where um, when the rotation is updated from game code that I will just allow the uh, Euler translation to, to clamp. Um, so by that I mean that the uh, uh, when it gets to be greater than positive 180 it loops back around to negative 180 um, on any given axis. Um, I think that's an okay, an okay thing to live with. It'll simplify the process of moving to the editor the changes that were made in the game code. Um, now, uh, there is one more question I have before we shut down Unity, um, and that has to do with the uh, ordering of the the ordering of the uh, angles. So, uh, if we take a look at um, roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, it's 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 a lot more conventional to do roll then pitch than yaw because um, the ordering of which angle you uh, rotate about matters when you're talking about Euler angles. Um, so roll is is about the z-axis. So if we do like that, like 30 degrees, uh, like so, um, pitch should be something that occurs after that, and it kind of. Hang on a second. Yeah, so this is the... So that's the... Okay, so this is X, Y, and Z. So this is this is correct. So um, with rotation then, uh, Z would be roll, it, and it looks like it. Um, then... Y is yaw, which makes sense, and then this is pitch. Um, yeah, it looks like it does apply roll, then pitch, then yaw, which makes sense to me. 
Um, so roll is something that you generally don't use too much of um, when you're orienting things in game code. Um, pitch, pitch and yaw um, tend to be like you're looking up, down, and then you're left and right. And it usually makes more sense to apply uh, looking up and down first and then rotating like this. Because the if you were to uh, do it the other direction, um, then you would wind up with um, looking up being like looking up and down being on a different plane than uh, you're used to. So um, in our code, then we're probably going to need to do away with the GLM. Uh, where is it? GLM Euler, Euler angles, because GLM Euler angles does not apply the angles in the same order. Um, it applies it in, uh, I think we established it, uh, roll, yaw, then pitch. And we need it to be roll, pitch, yaw. Um, I wonder if there's a GLM extension for this. Because they, um, there's a number of extensions that you can use uh, for doing specific things. So they do have Euler angle uh, uh, where you can change which angles you're changing. Change the order that they're applied. Man, my CPU cooler is abnormally loud because it's like 30 degrees outside. Oh boy, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Man, yeah, that's pretty awful. Um, yeah, the uh, yeah around here, um, it's been periodically getting to 100 Fahrenheit, which I think is like 37 Celsius, um, if I'm remember, remembering right. 100 F2 C. Yeah, like 37 Celsius outside. Um, yeah, so it's been really hard to keep my temperatures down. Um, I'm regularly just like do just like doing nothing. I'm regularly at like uh, like 48 or 50. Um, it's not great. But yeah, it looks like I could probably use this extension um, because we can specify the order in which we are doing uh, these things. So we can do uh, roll pitch yaw, which would be um, Z X and Y, I think. Yaw, pitch, roll. Is there one that just says roll, pitch, yaw? Out of curiosity, maybe it's not even extension. If I go to GLM and just look at the namespace. Um, it looks like we've got uh, functions for independently roll, pitch, and yaw. Returns yaw value of Euler angles expressed in radians. <clears throat> That's an interesting one. Oh, okay, so you, you can use you can punch in a quaternion and it'll get you the yaw component. That's um, confusing. It's confusing because you don't, it, that doesn't actually tell you anything about the order in which the roll pitch and yaw are applied. What's the Euler do? Euler angles constructs a. Uh... Oh, oil. Oh, it's the Euler constant. Okay. Huh. All right. Well, let's start. We, we've kind of been theorizing long enough. Let's consider how we might implement the uh, dual. Um, representation for rotation inside of Enterprise. 
Uh, I'm going to head to... Uh, let's open up the scene file. Test scene.ev scene. Um, while this seems like it, it should be a very simple thing, um, th this kind of fucks with my structure uh, for how I was storing data. Um, because the way that I was I was uh, storing data was that um, I wanted it to be possible for game code to be able to serialize a scene as well. So this would be something that you could do um, not just from the editor, but if you wanted to save the state of the game world, um, you could do it either in binary or in text format. Um, and so the, the way that the structure worked is that the entities section contained all the uh, the universal entity data. Then the component section would give each system a, its own section to deal with its unique sprite or unique uh, components. Uh, so the sprite component was registered by renderer 2D, and it gets this little block for each uh, sprite component that it wants to save, um, and it just specifies which entity the thing is is attached to. Um, so the, we're talking about adding an editor-specific element to the scene file, um, and that can be that can get a little bit awkward um, because if I wanted to reuse the same code for game code, um, I would need to have a section that doesn't interfere with this block. So um, one way might be to uh, have an extension. Uh, to the original YAML formatting, um, where we have the entity section and the component section, but then we also have an editor section. And this would contain data that is used by the editor. Um, and I was, I was kind of always planning on doing this anyway, but it was only for like global variables um, needed by the editor to handle a scene file. So things like which scenes are which scenes are adjacent to the scene. Um, so it'd be like adjacent uh, scenes, and then you'd have like a list of paths for scenes that need to be prepped to be loaded um, if you're going to be streaming uh, sections of levels uh, from other scene files, or things like that. Or um, having a little bit of trouble thinking of good examples, but things that you like you set once inside of a scene file. But now I'm suddenly needing a section that is essentially the same thing as the entity section, but it only contains editor-specific data, um, which isn't great. Let's take a look at the parser for, for this stuff. Um, that's going to be located in scenemanager.cpp, um, where we go to load scene file. So load scene file, we give it a path. Um, it loads the text file um, and then passes it to load entities from YAML. And this is where the parsing actually happens. So uh, this is one of the reasons, by the way, um, probably my biggest reason why I can't turn off exceptions in Enterprise is because uh, YAML is a fantastic library, YAML CPP. It's a fantastic library, but it uses exceptions uh, for operating. So like in order for me to uh, use it correctly, I have to be able to catch exceptions. Um, and it's frustrating, but it's like, yeah, I don't know, I'll just have to put up with it. Um, but yeah, anyway, we, uh, we go to YAML load, we pass in the source. Um, and then this YAML node now contains the tree. Uh, we basically just confirm that it's a map, and then we check for the entities, and uh, we check for, inside of entities, we look for every single element. Uh, so heading back to the scene file, uh, we are now iterating through every key that's inside of the entity section. And then from there, we are looking for specific values. Um, 
So what we could do is we could conditionally include a, another element into this. Um, so we could say, um, like in addition to checking for the position, rotation, and scale keys, um, which are all the elements that are sub to a uh, to an entity ID, we could add an additional else if, and then do um, entity data iterator second, and then look for like. Um, rotation boiler or something like that um, and then simply catch it if it exists um, the problem that I have with that is that it doesn't I don't like the I don't like the idea of putting so much logic into here that's editor specific. Um, we're talking about the, we're talking about code that should work for a game, um, having like a whole bunch of complexity added to it just for scene files. Um, whereas before I was able to treat them the same. I don't know. Um, I tell you what, though. Um, I think on the on the uh, research side, we've made quite a bit of progress. We we, we now know what the relevant facts are. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a break and mull them over for a little bit, uh, and then when I come back, uh, we'll have to pick pick an, an approach and then go with it. Uh, for implementing this additional rotation layer to the scene files. Um, I'll be back in, I'll say, 15 minutes.
Alrighty, I'm back. Cool. Now I've had <clears throat> I've had a minute to think about some of these things. And actually an advantage to Unity's approach. Just plugging my phone in. Uh, an advantage to Unity's approach has come to me. Um, there's a there's an aspect of uh, the, there's an aspect of doing multi-select that actually ties into this question. Um, <clears throat> and it occurred to me that it, that it might tie into how I handle this as well. Uh, let me uh, undo changes to that file, um, to this file, and then reload the editor. Uh, let's open up the scene. Um, here we go. Uh, so if we take a look at the transform component section, um, when we go to select multiple entities, uh, we're going to have a, an element, whenever an element is not equal uh, or approximately equal, because this is floating point, um, the, uh, we're going to have like dashes or whatever to indicate that you can't edit it. Uh, but it's occurred to me that if we don't do, like if we if we do a, a greater than 360 degree representation in in position, if we allow uh, unlocked bounds for the rotations, um, then we do a multi-select. It's possible that two elements would have um, would appear to multi-select even though they were set differently. Um, so that might come into why they bothered to uh, maintain the same rotation value when you're. I don't know. Now that I'm saying it out loud, it might, might be stupid. <laughs> I don't know. I, just, I, I can't tell why they do why they did what they did. Uh, I took a quick look at the scene component in UE4. They have something called F rotation conversion cache, world rotation cache. Not sure if it's related. Um, yeah. So I happen to know that. Uh, so like, in the in the Unity example that I just had, um, I don't think that they cache the local and world rotation, but they are separate things. Um, like they're actually they're actually modified separately. Um, do we have anything that's like local versus world and world up override? Yeah, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like we store uh, world stuff inside of the Unity scene file. At least not this one. Um, I'm not sure offhand whether what you found was related. Um, World rotation cache, rotation conversion cache. Okay, actually, yeah, maybe I misread your, misread what you typed. Yeah, that might be. It's it's possible. Um, conversion, uh, probably just related between. Did you uh, did you uh, catch what kind of values get stored in there? Let me open up uh, Unreal something or other. I'm opening up the opening up a basic. Oh, is the map really not uh, in text in Unreal? I thought it was. Uh... Huh. I thought for sure that the uh, um, map files, their versions of scene files, would be in um, text for version control, but maybe they just go straight binary. I don't know, I guess we'll, um, just to be thorough, we probably should take a look at how this is done inside of Unreal Engine before we move on.
I would be real interested to know whether um, in their physics code, whether it um, wraps around or if it stays in the same Euler range like uh, Unity does. Here's a basic scene. Um, yeah, it's a top down example map. Show an explorer. And that's open you in code. Well, that's fascinating. I guess I've never picked apart a, uh, you, a an Unreal scene file before, um, but it, it does surprise me a lot that these are uh, binary files and not um, and not straight up like YAML or something like that. Um, yeah, so we probably won't be able to get too much out of this. Um, let me see if the terms specifically that you cited are in here. Um, I'll look for a world rotation cache. No? How about rotation? There, there's a thing called cam rotation, relative rotation, and these are probably all... Yeah. Um, yeah, so it doesn't seem like I can infer from the internal uh, internals of a... Um, Unreal map, uh, how they represent the rotation in code. Um, let me look for those elements on the Unreal documentation, though. <coughs> Excuse me. Do I know a good RGB control software? I can't say that I do. Um, I don't do a huge amount of PC building, um, so I don't really do... Uh, I, like, I've built this PC, um, and I've built others, but I don't really do, like, RGB stuff. Were you looking at the source code, uh, what's up, when you were looking at the using component? I have the source code. Ironically, I have the source code on my MacBook, but I don't think I have it on my PC anymore. I might have to re-download re it. Yeah, at one point I was uh, playing around with the source code on the PC, but... Um, I have since rebuilt my PC and like wiped my hard drive, and I never had a need to bring it back. I do. I can probably just take a look there. I think I think um, the odds of somebody actually getting mad at me for showing parts portions of the source code on stream would probably be very small. Um, but technically speaking, it's a violation of the EULA um, to display the source code like this. Get, get component rotation uses of this uh, world rotation cache dot normalize. Um, where do I find? Oh, I had to find it in my repos down here. Um, get component rotation uses uh, world rotation cache dot normalize quat normalize quat to rotator. Okay, I see. Because if I'm remembering right, the rota rotator component is um, X, Y, and Z, isn't it? Uh, for roll pitch and yaw. 
I know that they have like their own uh, their own unit for it, their own type. Thanks. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a it's a type, then. Let me um, look for that type in here. <coughs> Probably in core. Uh, runtime engine classes engine. Thanks. Director, um, <coughs> defaults to identity stuff, makes sense. Okay, here we go, private, uh, F quaternion, F rotator. Oh, no, you're fine. I don't think, I don't think this is, I don't think this is off topic at all. Um, Cached quaternion, f quat matching cached rotator such that quat uh, cached rotator dot rotator equals cached rotator. Okay. So what they're explicitly saying here is that these are these two are um, intended to be equivalent, um, but invoking the conversion on them. is required for them to be equivalent. So um, let's find a conversion, quat to rotator. If cache quat doesn't equal in quat, then we assign it to in quat dot get normalized and get assigned cache rotator. Okay, so it kind of seems like this type is intended to be like um, a bridge between the two types, between quaternions and uh, rotators, which is basically their Euler angle type. Um, and then when they go to translate between the two, that's when they normalize. Well, I think nor what normalization means is like putting it in a normalized range. So there's no normalized... Uh, so when you normalize a quaternion or normalize a rotator, um, you are taking and making it. Um, you're taking. You're, you're bringing it back into the range uh, of like zero to negative 180 degrees or whatever, uh, or negative 180 to positive 180 degrees, um, or the equivalent of that in quaternion speak. Um, <clears throat> because quaternions, if I'm remembering correctly, they basically boil down to um, you can you assemble it from a axis and then a rotation. Um, and you can make that rotation value be any arbitrary number, but every 360 degrees it'll line it'll line up with a different um, with a different quaternion or the same quaternion. Um, so normalization is something that that you have to do in order to keep your stuff within a clamped range. And that's and that and the confu confusing part about Unity is that it specifically isn't renormalizing the Euler component. 
Um, so let me take a look at the rotation on, on something real quick. Um, so taking a look at this guy, um, and we're looking at its his rotation and scale and stuff. I've got like a really horrible frame rate. Um, it looks like it's normalized between 0 and 360. Yeah, and it actually it actually represents that um, with a bar, if you see that at the bottom. Um, but if I was to go like 450 and press enter, it would still work. It just gives me the equivalent. And then when I go to use the slider, it clamps between 0 and 360. It's kind of an interesting way to do it. It doesn't allow me to do negative. That's that's weird. If I, if I go into the uh, widget, though, I'm sure it will. Yeah, it'll let me go uh, negative uh, here, but then when I go to use the slider, it's only 0 to 360. That's a bit strange. If I continue with the widget, though, um, it does allow me to go way over. Um, if I was to hit play now, and <laughs> the guy's, <laughs> guy's standing sideways, uh, if we take a look at, uh, at him, I, I should probably uh, use simulate for this. How do I do simulate? Simulate. Um, so simulate the game is running and whatever. And I've got a gamepad here, which I should be able to. Oh, I can't. Damn it. Um, well, that's annoying. I can't. I can't control with a gamepad while I'm simulating. Attaches to the player controller. Uh, that's annoying. Um, I just wanted to see how the uh, rotation updated. Uh, but it kind of looks like they uh, clamp in this range. And going by the source code that you sent me, it kind of looks like they're they're using uh, the conversion whenever they convert to and from uh, Euler that they're normalizing at that time. Um, and that's explicitly not what Unity does. Um, because in Unity, we saw the... Uh, in Unity, we saw that uh, when the rock was falling and it was rotating because of changes to the physics code, that it would remain in the same range instead of normalizing. Um, which, yeah, I don't know why they would do that. But yeah, this was a very good rabbit hole to go down. Uh, thanks for thanks for pointing this out to me. Um, Every little piece, I'm learning something. <clears throat> but yeah, for uh, for this example, um, the, the only the only thing I can think of that might be relevant for why Unity would try and keep it unnormalized would be like if you use um, physics to drop two entities down, uh, and they were both in the out of normalized Euler range, maybe you'd want them to line up after um, using physics to floor your objects or something like that. I can't. I don't know. Maybe that that's that doesn't really hold up for me. Uh, I think the plan that I'm going to go for is that um, anytime you edit from here, uh, you're allowed to do any arbitrary value inside of the rotation. But when you go to update the rotation via game code. Um, which will just virtually always be via quaternions, um, it will automatically normalize uh, what display is inside of the inspector. So, um, yeah, it's going to require a little bit of work. Uh, let me first kind of decide how I'm going to handle the storing of this data in the scene file. Um, Heading back to Scene Manager, um, I had separated uh, I had separated the parsing into two methods or into two functions. So there's a uh, load scene file, which you pass in the path to a scene file, um, and this is intended to be loading the scene files produced by the editor. Um, and basically, what it does is it just makes sure that makes sure that the path is fine. It loads the file into memory because. Um, YAML CPP needs the entire thing in RAM. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we uh, pass that buffer into load entities from YAML. 
Um, and this can be used to either uh, uh, load YAML stuff uh, or to um, load hard-coded scenes. If you wanted to like, for some reason, construct a scene from YAML um, elsewhere. So um, if, you, if you had a custom save file, for example, um, and you wanted to store your your scene state in plain text for some reason inside of that file, um, you could do it by you could or you could load it by um, using load entities from YAML, passing in just the section of your save file that contains the scene stuff. Um, that would be one way to do it. Um, so the two approaches that I that I can think of for how to structure the scene file with this new data would be to either insert the data into here and make it just like um, editor specific. So it'd be like rotation uh, Euler hint. Uh, and then we would have just the, the stuff that's specific to the editor. Um, or we would have a, se a separate section for um, like editor, entity entities or something like that and then like for every entity in entities we would have the editor specific stuff in here like that um I can't think of an example as to why you might want to use rotation Euler hints inside of a game. You could, for example, make a level editor in your game. Yeah, it's possible. So um, just in terms of like the plan, um, right now I'm not bothering with baking I'm right now just doing loose files, um, but I'm designing the API around the presumption that at some point in the future, I'll provide the option for baking your stuff. Um, so when you go to bake your scene file, it, go, it obviously will go away from plain text and into a binary format that's faster to load. Um, <clears throat> and you could, in those cases, when you go to bake the scene file, just eliminate this item. Um, however, uh, up until I've got a game shipping out of this, I'm going to just do everything with loose files. Um, and you can le you can legitimately um, ship games where it's just loose files, right? I think like, do I still have Celeste installed? I guess not. Um, in Celeste, it's like literally all the co the game content is like plain text. I don't know if you knew this, uh, but they literally you can go in and like like change the level up by changing the text files and you can change what the dialogue the characters say and, and stuff like that it's all in plain text um so there's i mean like, you know big games have been shipped without uh baking their stuff um big as in like financially successful um so like for me that's just not a priority um because i'm not doing i'm not doing like nanite level uh you know 3d graphics simulations and stuff this game is kind of fun to mod. Yeah, it's and and it, that that too is that if you give if you make clear entry points into your game, uh, then that's just uh, a huge gift to the modding community. If uh, you want people to be able to mod your game, um, and people have gone to town making their own uh, Celeste levels. Um, but yeah, setting that aside, um, I'm just going to be doing plain text at first. Um, my question is is kind of concerned with. Um, the two ways in which this serialization code may be used. The first being obviously loading and saving scene files from the editor, but it's also got the function that uh, if you wanted to save and restore um, game state, you might also use it, but then not want the Euler hint. Actually, now that I've, now that I've talked about that out loud, I think I kind of have the solution that I want. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do um, 
uh, editor specific stuff inside of the entities list. So we'll do um, add, uh, I don't know, ED rotation whaler hint or something like that. Um, like I'll put ED in front of the stuff that's editor specific. Like something like that, that seems to be pretty decent. Um, and then what I'll do is inside of the parser, where we go to the load entities from YAML, um, because this, this is something that you'll use. This is this is the function that you'll use directly if you are loading a uh, um, if you're loading up a uh, a section of your game save files that has the scene saved in YAML. Um, we could uh, either pass in a bool that says uh, is scene file, um, or we could do um, like a global state variable that is set when we invoke from load scene file. Um, okay, but then the, the then the question becomes if if this is the way that we do it. If we add an optional section to this that's skipped over when you're loading a scene file from game code, then how do we make that visible to the editor and not to the game level, game level, um, to the game code? Because the game code, you could either make that deep data visible and have it be useful in some way, uh, or if it's something that I don't want them to be playing with, I want them to be using. Uh, Quaternions only, or at least going translating from the Quaternions uh, only, which I think is what I want to do. Then I would want to hide this data from the parsed scene data. Okay, yeah, I, I actually I, I know what I need to do, and it's going to be really hard. So remember, yesterday we were talking about. Um, we were talking about the problem with uh, doing uh, systems, using classes as namespaces, um, like I do for my systems. If I go to graphics.h. Um, this is a piece of tech debt that I've been meaning to address for a while, uh, because the old way that I had structured my systems was that I'd make a class, uh, put all the public API stuff in the public section, and then uh, in the private section, I would, I would have the state that would be shared between uh, the uh, various CPP files that implement the system. Um, maybe we make the add things optional if it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's yeah we could totally do that, um, and I think that's I think that's what I want to do. Um, the uh, I don't know if I want to do it as in like you we're searching for those characters ed and then optionally handling them uh, because the the we're going to be optionally handling each key anyway um, so we might as well just check to see if the things we care about are there <clears throat> excuse me um but yeah i think that uh i'm going to need to address this problem now um, because one of the problems that this uh this arrangement has is that i don't have an easy way for me to expose private state from a system to the editor layer without also exposing it to the game layer, um, which means that I have to do sometimes some really hacky uh, pass-through stuff. Like uh, when we were doing the uh, runtime uh, in the editor, we have the we have stuff like uh, get frame get editor play frame buffer and set editor play frame buffer. And this, all it does is it invokes the, it, set, it sets the value in the private state for the runtime. And it has to be done this way because um, this is this is a private member of runtime and you need to have a, have a friend uh, be able to access the data. And it's like, like this is only here because I have classes uh, being used as namespaces. Um, if I, got rid of that now, then it would actually suddenly be a lot simpler for me to be able to um, access hidden state like this. Um, 
from scene manager. Because what I could do is I could have scene manager um, hand conditionally handle uh, the uh, editor specific stuff, and then store that in some hidden state variable that's not visible to the game layer, but I can get using a internal header uh, by including an internal header into the editor state. Um, that wouldn't require friendship. It, uh, it would. It wouldn't require uh, hacky pass-throughs. It would just be um, the inspector directly accessing C Manager's uh, list of uh, rotation oilers. Um, so, yeah, and, and if I was to to hack my way around this problem again. It'll just make it that much harder for me to extradite myself. So I think that I think that this kind of is the plan. Uh, I think I've got it, got the plan figured out. Uh, so the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to change to namespaces uh, for core systems. Uh, this is going to be a significant amount of work, but it's it's now it's now the main thing getting in my way. Um, so I have to do I have to do it now. Once that's done, um, I will uh, optionally uh, save or read load um, editor specific state from scene files via scene manager load YAML. Um, or load from YAML or whatever it was called. Um, and then inside of the editor layer, it'll just directly read uh, editor specific state from C Manager via internal headers. Um, yeah. And so at that point, uh, we can then have an interface set up in such a way where whenever uh, we go to update, let's go back to the inspector. Um, whenever we go to update the, uh, the inspector panel, uh, what we've been doing is we've been getting entity rotation, converting it into Euler angles, then degrees. Instead of doing that, we would just be getting the rotation from EP C manager, uh, it would be like um, uh, rotation uh, Euler hints, and then like the passing in the entity ID that we care about, um, and then this would be getting the direct representation of the the uh, the Euler angles from the engine layer. Um, and we can work with that directly. And then every time we make a change uh, to it, we would be converting from that into the internal oil representation. And it would be like a one-way trip. You would make the change in the editor, it would reflect in the game. And then in the game code, when that goes to update, it can also update the oiler state um, so that we see the change inside of the editor. We don't have, um, it's, we don't have a circular uh, translation going on where we go um, from the Quaternion to the Euler and then we edit the Euler and then that goes back into the internal representation and then it just goes on and on and back and forth uh, because that results in the bugs that we're seeing already. Instead it would be just that whenever we make a change from the editor it would change the state, uh, the Quaternion state in the engine layer and vice versa, whenever we change the state from the engine layer, it'll change the uh, Euler representation in the editor. And that doesn't, each of those things don't, they don't re-trigger the whole loop. Um, so you can go, you know, set your rotation to 380 degrees in the editor. The internal representation will be a normalized quaternion. And then if and when the game code changes that normalized quaternion to be something else, it'll automatically update the values in the editor to be a normalized uh, Euler transform, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, that's a 
yeah, I think that's I think that's a good plan. But um, it means we got got quite a lot of work ahead of us. Um, I'm wondering whether I've got the time to do that this morning. Uh, I've got. I could probably do this in a couple of hours. So we're gonna probably gonna have to change tact for a little bit. We're gonna need to do this refactor. Um, and once that's done, it'll make the process of correctly handling rotations in the inspector a lot easier to deal with. Um, specifically in the way that we have to extend the, in the way that we have to extend the uh, scene files. Yeah, to be honest, I'm just not, I'm really not looking forward to it. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm going to get some water um, because I'm already very raspy. Um, and then when we get back, we'll start up on that refactor. Um, and hopefully it'll be finished uh, quicker than it seems like it will be. But once that's done, we'll finally be able to get to work on the... Uh, fixing this rotation bug. Um, yeah, let me quickly change the details of the stream because um, we're no longer dealing with inspector view. We're dealing with um, the uh, systems refactor. There we go. Um, and I'll, I'll be back in just like, I don't know, five minutes or something. I just got to get some water and, uh, <clears throat> you know, wet the whistle. Alrighty, I'm back. <clears throat> Sweet. All right, this is gonna be fun. This is the trouble with tech debt, right? Is that you don't want to, you ever, you don't ever want to go and break that egg open. Um, but you have to. Uh, let's real quickly confirm any any and all changes that we have pending. Um, So, yeah, the game and the scene views were modified to add depth buffers. So let's add those in, in their own commit. Um, <clears throat> added depth buffers to 
game and seen you FBs. There was also the uh, issue with the frame buffers that we had to fix down here, where we where we had forgotten to actually store the handles for um, render buffers. And then uh, the window code uh, actually doesn't have any changes. I just changed to using double buffered for the sake of using re render doc. So let me undo that change. Um, <clears throat> cool. And then renderer 2D still got those changes that I'm not going to bother to commit uh, because those are only for the sake of working. Um, and then setting depth test to true on the um, Renderer 2D, I'm going to leave that as it is as well. Um, that's not something I care about committing. Um, and then we added, in the scene manager, we added the setters and getters, um, or no, the setters for the uh, entity details. So let's uh, commit that. Where's the uh, implementation on create entity? I thought I had modified that as well, but. Oh, I guess not. All all that's changed is the um, the uh, uh, Clang format has added some stuff. All right. I've got some problems with the uh, way that we've got um, selection working with the editor right now. I basically just copied in the uh, state from the uh, uh, from the the hierarchy view, and I probably should just create new state for the list of entities that we have selected instead of going through that entire bit field. But for now, this is good enough. I'll go ahead and commit it. So on the inspector then, yeah, so we'll include hierarchy.cpp, inspector.cpp, and then the state files.
And of course, the CMake file modification that adds the state.h and state.cpp. There we go. All right, so now we're all caught up. Um, I've still got those couple of things in Renderer 2D that um, are really just, they're really just preludes to um, actual work on the editor or on the uh, Renderer. Um, and I don't want to commit them yet because I'm just, I just have these modifications in place to make them easy, to make the Renderer easier to work with for now. <coughs> all right, cool. And now we're onto the refactor. Um, so, essentially, the everything we need to change is just in the headers for the systems. Um, the way that I had the structure working at this point was that you would, uh, inside of en the enterprise include folder, uh, you would just include the name of the system that you wanted to include. And that contains uh, the class that um, has all of the private state for that system. Um, I think the way that I'm going to handle uh, system headers going forward will be that instead of including all of this stuff inside of the header, we would just make the, the graphics header be a header that includes all the other graphics headers. So you can either include, um, if you're making an entire pipeline, you can just include graphics.h and that will include everything needed to do that. Uh, or if you just needed a couple of things from graphics, you can just go enterprise graphics and then the thing that you want to include. Um, let's start uh, going th through these one by one. Uh, core is actually just a collection of things that's shared throughout the entire library. Um, it's not, not actually uh, got a class in it. Uh, so it's got helpful things like bit, which is just a little macro that does a one bit shifted over, and I probably now that I remember, now that I remember that this is here, I probably could have used this inside of the uh, bit field code that we wrote uh, in the editor. But that's yeah, it's back burner stuff. Um, the events system though, uh, events.h does contain a class that is events. So let's change that. We're going to say instead of class events, we're going to say namespace events. Um, when we do namespaces, uh, the public and private things don't really apply anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, and so let's start here. Um, inside of the namespace events section, uh, we've got the event class, we've got the data event class, We've got uh, these types, type defs, um, the event callback pointer, um, and so on. Um, the term static no longer applies uh, for these API calls because they're not static functions anymore. They're just uh, functions declared in this header defined in the CPP file. Yeah, we can just replace all those with empty text. Um, I don't think we need to change anything about the <coughs> event class or the data event class. The event callback pointer type def is fine as well. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think if we look at how the uh, Doxygen documentation comes out, uh, 
I don't think the, the namespaces actually get labels because you can declare them anywhere. So um, this bit here, um, just get rid of it. Um, and we can also just, instead of doing namespace CP and namespace events, this is C17, so we can just do that. EP events. Subscribe, subscribe. Okay. And then down here, uh, this is where things get a little bit messy. Um, these are the private, the formerly private members of uh, events. Is there any reason why you do not enable C20? Um, there's one big reason, and that's because uh, it's not supported by Apple Clang. Um, Apple Clang is the compiler that I need to use for um, compiling in Xcode on Mac. Um, but it, it also mostly wasn't it wasn't nearly as widely available when I started um, Enterprise a couple of years ago. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of compilers that have most of the C20 features. Um, but back when I started on this, C17 was the um, most recent widely available uh, version. But yeah, I think I'm going to stick with uh, C17. Um, because porting to C20 at this point would be a bunch of unnecessary work and it wouldn't it would be all for naught on the Apple platform. Um, but yeah, so this is where we gotta uh, deal with private stuff. So uh, we had these couple of private uh, members of the events class, specifically the list of callback pointers. Um, and then we had a <clears throat> we had a function that was editor specific and editor play cleanup. Uh, this stuff is going to go in a new header inside of the new events folder. I didn't I didn't actually have an events folder until now. So I'll add it now. And inside of here, uh, what do we call this one? I guess it would be events implementation at H. Um, that feels... I know that there's like a convention where you say you add implementation to the headers that are um, not intended to be used inside of the public uh, interface. Um, but this feels a little misleading because it's not exactly um, just implementation. It's exposing things to the editor layer and the uh, launcher layer skipping the game layer. Um, so maybe a name that's like private or something would, would be better. I don't know. On the fence about that, but we'll figure it out later. Um, this stuff now needs to go into that file. Um, <clears throat> we no longer need to friend anything. Um, this is going to be inside of the events namespace as well. So we'll go namespace um, ep events and move that down to the bottom. Um, and then we need the we need the state manager header. Um, and we need a couple of other standard headers as well. I don't think we need initialized list. We do need uh, an ordered map. No, we, need, we need list. We need tuple. There's actually a number of headers that are not listed here that I need. Must have included them from one of these other headers. So um, move you down. 
we need list, we need uh, tuple, um, we need <coughs> functional. Right, functional? No, I'm thinking of uh, the smart pointers, which is from, is it from memory? I can't quite remember. Yes, from memory. Stay. Oh, I need to. Um, <clears throat> this this will give me red squiggles until I add this file to CMake lists. So let's do that. I don't know why my voice gets so raspy when I'm on uh, Twitch specifically. It's like when I talk to other people in real life, it doesn't ever get this bad, but I get really, really sore throat uh, short, uh, shortly through one of these streams. I'm gonna add, yeah, I'm gonna have to add yet another list. Um, for the sake of conditional compilation, I've broken up all my source files into discrete lists. There's the engine headers. This is the headers that are shared to the uh, game layer. Um, and thus far, uh, this is also where the headers are, are shared also to um, the uh, private layer. I'm gonna need to change locations as well. Man. This is not gonna be a fun refactor. So um, include slash enterprise. This is where the public stuff has been going. I need to have a second location for the private stuff. Um, I think I'm gonna add the private headers just to the source folder and then Oh, music moved out of the uh, moved out of the uh, creator safe playlist area. Let's throw something else on. Okay. Um. Yeah, so inside of the source folder where we have the events.cpp, I'll have the private header as well. I like the idea of calling it state, events state, so this will be the header for... Nah, let's go back to private. Um... Oh, what happened to my... Uh... I renamed the file and then it deleted the contents. That's great. Um, let me get back to events.h. And copy it all out again. And then in cmakelists.txt, uh, we're now going to add it to the source files. As far as exposing it to the editor, 
let's quickly review how we <clears throat> how we add those files to the editor. Uh, so these are the editor specific source files, editor vendor source files. Um, executable editor kind of looks like we just get the <clears throat> the stuff that's made uh, part of the interface from the editor project uh, so we say or from the engine project so when we go to link the editor to the engine library, the engine library um, CMake file, uh, it's public stuff just comes into the editor. So let's take a look at uh, how this is set up. Okay, so we got target include directories. Um, they include the include, vendor, 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 vendor. Um, and then we include privately the source. So the include directory is, is automatically included in the editor layer. So I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to uh, uh, manually add the include directory, the source directory, um, as an include directory to the editor layer. Um, so on the engine side, we add the file to the source. So we make a change to the file, it'll trigger a recompile. Um, and then on the editor layer, uh, we will manually add the engine source directory as an include directory. And that's how we'll get the private stuff. Um, and that's also how the game layer will skip receiving the private stuff. So let's go to uh, the editor. Um, and we'll go to includes target include directories. Um, so privately, we're adding source, we're adding vendor I and GUI. Um, I also need to add the engine library now. So that's gonna be um, up a level and then into engine uh, and into source. And I'll need to do the same thing for the launcher. I guess I wasn't even setting this in the launcher. Um, I didn't add any uh, include directories to it. Um, so now we've got uh, events private.h, um, which should be linking up correctly um, or available to the others as an include. Um, I'll need to include that other stuff we had going, um, like 
uh, memory, include list, and include tuple. Um, we we'll also need to include core. If I can spell include correctly. Um, and include enterprise. Oh, it's not picking up enterprise. Source events, events private. Okay, we'll, fi we'll fix this in a minute. Uh, that state manager is needed. And then STD on order map. Is an order map just part of map, or is that its own thing? Yeah, it's an unordered map. seems to be, um, IntelliSense seems to be parsing some of this, but not all of it. Probably because there's an issue with state manager state. So actually, oh, it's the namespace. Hang on. Namespace. Um, namespace EP uh, events, and then... Now that we're inside of the EP namespace, state manager should be available. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now that this is no longer a private class member, we have to do this as an extern, which means that we don't have to export this symbol now because it's just going to be an extern. Well, no, we have to export the symbol. I'm a little confused as to how that, that, that'll that shake out. Um, but it's, it has to be marked extern because uh, otherwise this is going to define it everywhere. And I think that the symbol has to be exported. Otherwise, you know, yeah, I'm a little confused by that. I think I think it, I think the correct thing to do is uh, you do extern and then you declare and then on the definition in the CPP file you do the API uh, export symbol. Yeah. Um, so in events.cpp, we will now add these definitions. Actually, they're already here. Um, but instead of doing events colon colon callback pointers, we just do callback pointers. Um, So callback pointers are here. This needs to be exported. So we'll say EP API. The editor play cleanup calls in here. Yeah, there it is. And regular cleanup is in here as well. All right, let's start resolving these red errors 
if runtime is editor and runtime is running. Uh, these are errors because these are private members of runtime, um, which we no longer have access to because we're not doing classes. So I'll have to leave these errors as they are, and then we'll get back to that once we get once we get the runtime moved out of moved out of its class and moved into a namespace. Okay. And then I'll need to add include enterprise events. Wait. Yeah, enterprise events slash events private dot h. I believe that should work. Or no, I would just do this. Yeah, because this is this is from the source source directory, not from the include. Alright. All right, so that's the events system done. Um, ironically, we can't compile until we've finished the refactor because the systems are so interdependent that we need to. Uh, yeah, we need to do this on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, so after the event system, we got the file system. Another big, long, complicated one. Um, we'll change this to be the space, like that. Uh, no use for the private or public keywords now. Yeah, this is another giant one. by getting rid of all these static keywords. Yep. All right. For now, I'm gonna still leave all of these declarations in the same header, but once we get the namespaces working and compiling, I'll be free to move these into separate headers, which is going to be, it's going to greatly reduce the complexity of the code. And then for all of this private stuff, we're going to need to head to file, and we'll add a new file to it, file underscore private dot h. Um, <clears throat> we'll go back to uh, CMake lists. I might as well just leave this open, actually. And then CMake lists underneath the source down here. We will add file, source, file, file, private.h. Okay. And then we can get rid of the friend class business um, and friend bool business um, and just copy out all of this stuff to the private header. And then this is going to be inside of e EP file, the namespace. Cool. Um, so far, so good.
And interestingly, this doesn't have too many cross dependencies, so this appears to have no red error, no red error squiggles in it. Um, just quickly looking for anything that we need to define with the next term. I don't see anything. Um, file.cpp and we've got some errors here so in file.cpp now this is going to be namespace file or ep file um, and then down at the bottom I'll update the comment okay now that we're inside of uh, ep file all this stuff is part of the file namespace anyway Yeah, so I want to replace this, replace file colon colon in some places, but not others. Um, so the comment, mostly the error messages that say file colon colon whatever, those need to remain. But the rest of it can be eliminated. These red squiggles are, are um, <clears throat> saying that runtime is editor is a private member of runtime, so we can't access it. Uh, we'll fix that in a little bit. Um, get new temp file name is undefined. Uh, that should be in the header. Oh, it's in the private header. I moved, I moved it into here. So for that, we need to include. Include enterprise slash file. No, actually, it would just be file slash file private. Okay. Speaking of which, let's take a look at it. Um, we've got bool is alphanumeric. Get new temp file name. All of these private state variables. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. Um, on this file, though, we do need to include std. Oh, that's interesting. Hang on a second. So file underscore private dot h appears to be, um, it appears to understand what an std string and an std string view is without my including the header. Um, and I think I know why that is. It's because of the way that CMake does pre-compiled headers. CMake has uh, basically just takes and produces an object containing all of the headers uh, that you want in your pre-compiled header, and then it force adds it to uh, the compilation process for all the source files. And this header file is inside of the source uh, group. So these these private files are getting all of the uh, pre-compiled headers in them. That might be kind of nice. I'm going to leave it as it is for now and see if it compiles correctly. If it doesn't, then we can uh, figure out a way to avoid pre-compiled headers inside of this header. But yeah, that's interesting. I've never done a pre-compiled header inside of a pre inside of a header. That's uh, not normally what they're for. <sighs> All right. Um, but yeah, so far so good. Um, this is looking like we're ready to move on. So let's try. 
the game entry point. Game entry point is actually just a pure header. Um, it contains the function pointers to the game entry point and all the all the stuff about um, making sure that it's exported in the correct builds and whatever. Uh, now we're looking at the big one, graphics.h. This this is almost a thousand lines of just just prototypes and uh, documentation. Uh, so let's change it. So now we're looking at uh, namespace EP graphics. Um, at the end of the public section, I will close it. And then the private stuff will go into its own header. And we'll do that down here. So new file, graphics, private.h. And we'll add private here. I've got an error somewhere. Could not find source graphics private.h. Really? It's there. I don't see where it says graphic without an S, private .h. Yeah, the header has an S in it. Oh, graphics slash private dot H. Hang on. Yeah, whoops. It's this. <laughs> uh, it should be an underscore, not a slash. Oh, but it also should be graphics slash. Ah! <laughs> Source graphics, graphics private dot H. There we go. <laughs> um, thanks. All right, now inside of the uh, private header, we can take all the stuff that was in the private section, cut it, post it. Um, how do you handle Unicode and UTF-8? Are you talking about um, within my source files? Or are you talking about within the within my code, like programmatically handling it, or? handling it in my my files. These need to be all external. programmatically game text, dialogue text. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I, I prefer to use uh, uh, UTF-8 for everything until I can't anymore. Um, there's a, a excellent movement called UTF-8 Everywhere. You might have heard of it. I'm gonna pull it up. This is an excellent read. 
and I prescribe to this philosophy. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, whenever you're computing, um, you're adding a bunch of complexity to programmatically working with wide strings. So you want to do UTF-8 everywhere you can up until the point where you need to use wide strings. You need, need, to, need to use Unicode. Um, uh, so in the case of like game game text or game content, that means that you'll store your your wide string stuff inside of content files, and then programmatically handle those into what you display on the screen. Um, so like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to be hard coding character dialogue, for example, um, if you're playing a game and you're uh, you got text on the screen that is what the characters are saying. Uh, it's it's not wise to hard code that stuff. You want to put it in a content file so you can tweak it without changing your code. Um, even if that goes into a um, a uh, baking or or a pre-compilation step, like if you're doing like resource compiling, sure. Um, but you want that to be separate so that way you can do localization and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the. Uh, uh, I try to use UTF-8 for everything internally, and then when I, at the point where I need to use it, for, use it for like the file system API or whatever, then I will translate to uh, wide string. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so I've added graphics private.h, but for some reason it's not getting the enterprise header. Or isn't it? Okay, it is, it's just that IntelliSense is not. Not picking up on it, whatever. Um, okay, so those are, those are gonna be extern. I need GLM in here. Uniform buffer handle is type def declared in graphics.h. I need that in here, so I'm actually going to include graphics.h uh, inside of here as well. Like so. Basically, this is just a bunch of busy work. Okay. Good. And then... Oh, it is uh, it is defined, but it's not um, in, in the right namespace. Okay, graphics.cpp. 
Thanks. Windows UTF-16, LE, white card T, kind of weird. I tried to use a UTF-8 too. Too much of a program. Problem, too much of a problem to handle their encoding. Yeah, it's like, um, you, I mean, like a person can get used to working with wide, wide string formats. Um, UTF-8, UTF-16 and 32 are the big ones um, because those are, you know, universal. But it, um, yeah, it's like, it, it, it just makes your code more complicated um, to be working with those formats. To be like storing and editing and tweaking uh, strings made with white characters, just simply because you have to deal with multiple bytes per character now. Um, so it's yeah. It, when you're working internally, uh, you should basically always be using UTF-8 in my in my opinion, um, because it just makes it just makes things a lot simpler. Like if you go to allocate bytes for for a string, how many bytes do you allocate? Well, how many characters you got? It's the same question, right? It also makes things uh, really nice for um, working with binary files as well. Um, like if you remember, we were looking at um, m most kinds of binary files will uh, still put in UTF-8 text to make it readable. Uh, so you can tell like from a glance at the header of the file, what kind of file it is or something like that. If we were to open up the um, uh, Unreal project that we were working on before, once again. Uh, so that'll be, I think it was test. I forget the name. I think it'll just be test project or whatever. But yeah, like, it, it, like if you open up a um, content, uh, starter content, maps. Yeah, open up a map. Um, and you open it up anyway with the hex editor. Um, you'll, you'll, you can take a look at the binary file, even if it's got binary stuff in it, um, and still be able to like read what's in the header. And, like all down here, this is all you know, not nonsense to a human, but you can just take a look at the, at the top and know what kind of binary file it is. It's really, uh, it's really useful. Oh, the no problems, man. This isn't quite. This isn't quite an AMA or an Ask Me Anything channel, but um, I I like talking about this stuff. Okay. Um, so now that we're in the graphics.cpp file, um, we need to include the private header like that to make these formerly private things come back um, into scope. Uh, and we'll also be using EP graphics namespace instead of uh, putting graphics colon colon everywhere. Good. Um, and there's probably a whole bunch of stuff that's broken in the other graphics uh, CPP files. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave them be for now. And then once we get all the headers sorted out, uh, we'll see what breaks during compilation and then fix them. <clears throat> cool. Um, all right, so that's graphics.h taken care of. Uh, let's look at input.h. So rinse and repeat, we'll just do uh, get rid of the class declaration, make it a namespace declaration, get rid of the uh, public and private keywords. This is going to be a, a lot nicer when it's done, but it's one of those things that I just really wish I didn't have to spend time doing. And inside of the input folder of the source directory, we'll do input.h. Input um, let's add it to the lists.
input slash input underscore private. Um, and then all of this stuff can be copied into the private header. Okay. And then we'll put this all in the correct namespace. Like so. We'll need to get rid of all these static keywords in the header. None of this needs to be marked extern. <clears throat> yeah, technical debt sooner or later gonna bite you. This is th thankfully like I've I've matured to the point where um, I've matured to the point where I wouldn't make this kind of uh, organizational mistake in the first place. But um, yeah, yeah, you're right. At least this is uh, doable. the static keywords in here as well. At least I think they're all. There's actually a couple of static that we need to keep. Struct. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, okay, we need to keep a couple. Um, I'll just replace all and then worry about the... Oh, no. Let me replace all within a certain range. So I'll select this block, turn on uh, find in selection, and then re replace all of those static keywords with nothing. And then make sure that I'm not deleting the static keyword out of those structs, because those actually need, need them. Um, and in these cases, these need to be marked extern. And I need to, need to include glm slash glm.hpp. IntelliSense is doing weird things with these files. Uh, these headers that are inside the source directory. Um, we may need to do some rearranging on that fact, but for now we can still confidently make changes to the code. Um, control ID is a type declared in input.h, so we need to include input.h now. This is looking pretty good. Let's go to input.cpp. Um, we'll need to change this to be namespace cp input as well. Um, and then all cases of input colon colon, except for these errors.
All right, I'll have to do these one by one. <laughs> so next match, the next match button, it's uh, it's quick key is the enter key, and so is the replace option. That's annoying, so I can't just like rapidly use my keyboard to change between whether I'm replacing or skipping. Okay, that, that's good. Um, KBM mouse buffer is undefined. That's because it's a private detail. So we'll include enterprise slash input, wait, we include input slash input private.h, and we'll get that. Okay, we've got more squiggles from runtime is editor and runtime is running, which we'll be addressing later. Uh, state manager active state is something that we're trying to access. Um, so that's eventually going to require us to include state manager. Hang on a second. Include enterprise slash, or sorry, include state manager slash state manager private.h, um, which is a header that doesn't exist yet, but that's going to include the implementation detail for those private members. Uh, formerly private members. There's also uh, a secret getter function for the time system. Um, time actual real delta. Um, this is because uh, I need uh, I need unscaled and undivided values, uh, time values, in order to correctly um, divide the speed of mouse movement by uh, the time that's passed since the last frame. So we'll also have a private time header as well, which isn't ready yet. Okay, and that's good for this file. All right, moving on, where are we now? We just done input.h, now let's do runtime.h. Um, runtime.h is um, interesting because we can't actually, uh, we can't actually uh, make this a namespace because we do need to instantiate a runtime object, but we're gonna need to separate those concerns. Because um, right now the way that that works is that um, we create it and we destroy it whenever we need to uh, load up the game module. Um, and then we invoke the static run on it when we want to uh, update. Um, everything else is an API related to runtime, but it doesn't actually part of the uh, creation destruction process of runtime. So I guess we can still follow the same scheme of runtime underscore private, but that might get a little bit confusing because it would suggest that runtime is the name of a namespace and it's not. Um, maybe I could take these functions, the uh, specifically the register run runtime option, or sorry, register command line option, and get command line option. Maybe I could take all of those and make them um, put them out and do a, a different API. 
What does runtime CPP, not CPP look like? Maybe that'll. Yeah, so a big a big chunk of runtime.cpp is the um, command line option stuff. Maybe that should be like in like its own header and its own like core namespace. I think I like that idea. I think moving this stuff out into somewhere else might be helpful. Let's go to core. Um, so this is the stuff that's universal um, across the engine. I think we're going to add uh, command line stuff to the core section of the source code. Um, so that way, whenever you need to access uh, command line options, you would do it by accessing core or core slash command line or something like that. Um, so we'll say cmdoptions.h is the name of that header. Um, oh, I haven't been using pragma once in all of my headers. Uh, I'll come back to that. Oof. Man, refactors like this are just... Trying. They try me. Um, so anyway, we're going to add some more stuff to the uh, core. So we'll add, <clears throat> in addition to the hash names.cpp, we're going to add a cmd options.cpp. Um, and we're going to, in the headers, in the actual headers, not the private uh, headers, we're going to do an additional option here. So we've got assertions, console, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'll do, right above console, I'll do include enterprise for, um, and this will be cmd options stage. Cool. And then inside the runtime, uh, we're going to take this stuff out. So register, check, and get command line options. Those will go into here. Um, on this, I think I'm going to just put them in the enterprise namespace directly. Um, and so instead of doing like EPCMD or something like that, you would say EP register command line option, EP check command line option, and so on. Um, I suppose I could do something like this, CMD. It would be like EPCMD and then register command line option. Nah, I'm just gonna leave it inside of the enterprise namespace. Okay, good, those are looking good. Uh, let's add the source file now. Okay, um, and then in this one we'll include the CMD options. Dot H. Um, that's interesting because uh, CMake lists. Oh, CMake lists wouldn't have configured because I didn't have the source file available yet. Okay, there we go. Uh, so that should be linking up fine. And then in here, we can copy out the definitions that we had set up inside of uh, runtime.cpp. So we'll take the state tracking. And we'll take the register check and get functions and put them into here as well. Okay. And then we'll do uh, namespace EP. Like that. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll need the other core headers for this, so um, I'll do the... Yeah, I'll, I'll do them all at once. I'll do uh, include enterprise core.h uh, enterprise <laughs> enterprise core.h um, and that should give me the hash names um, and the other stuff. Um, these are no longer members of runtime, so I'll need to get rid of the runtime scope modifiers. Yeah. All right, and then we've got uh, an issue here. Command line option help entry. There's a missing class definition or a struct definition. These need to go into the header. Okay, so um, these details were inside of the former private section of runtime.h. Um, so we're going to need to add a private header as well. Uh, let's go to core, right click and say new. We'll say CMD options private.h. Um, and then I'll paste them in here. Um, this is going to be the uh, namespace EP, um, like that. Bam. Um, and then I need to add this to CMake lists. Like this. That's reconfigured now. Um, I just need to include. Or, yeah, I need to include uh, enterprise core.h. Like that. Um, to get the hash names and stuff. Um, and that precompiled header is technically populating the other types into uh, this file. Uh, I'm not sure how workable that is, but we'll leave it for the moment because we don't have red squiggles. Um, good. Now, now, now that all of that's there, um, inside of command line options.cpp, we can add the private header. Like that. And then these definitions from runtime.cpp, uh, particularly uh, print command line help. We can put that now into cmd options.cpp. And Doesn't look like we've got other definitions to worry about. Yeah. 
that's looking pretty good. Um, inside of runtime.cpp though, we've got some scoping issues. Um, but register CMD command line option and all these other command line API things, uh, they're no longer available through the runtime.h. So we need to add the uh, include uh, enterprise slash core slash uh, cmd options.h. Actually, that should probably just be part of core.h, shouldn't it be? Yeah, let's add it to, to here. All the, the only red squiggles in this file now are the core calls for the systems, the uh, init, uh, update, draw, cleanup, and all that stuff. And we can uh, address that as soon as we've got those systems all moved to namespaces. But yeah, I think we're uh, in good shape now regarding runtime. Okay, so that was that was runtime.h. Um, wait. We're not done with runtime.h, what am I saying? Uh, runtime.h. We've moved the CMD stuff out of runtime.h. That's all we've done. Um, So all of these other API things, uh, quit, run, create engine runtime, destroy engine runtime, you can argue that these items are related to um, the instance of the runtime we create. So I'm just gonna leave those as they are. Um, so we should be fine. All right, now we're moving on. Um, scene manager.h. Uh, we're down to one, two, three, three systems that need to be refactored. Um, window is a little complicated because I think that's also instanced. Um, yeah, from here we're going to do EP clean space, and we have these constants inside the uh, inside the header that I do want to keep there. So instead of doing namespace EP scene manager, I'm just going to do nest and namespace calls like that, um, which makes sense here. Uh, we no longer use the private uh, or public uh, access modifiers. Um, and at the very end of what was the public section, I will close the namespace. Cool. Um, we don't have private anymore. We don't have uh, friends anymore. Uh, we just do the stuff inside of the uh, inside of the private header. Uh, so let's add that. Down here, right click, new file, uh, scene manager private.h. Cool. And then all of this stuff can go in here. Um, namespace EP scene manager. And we don't have static anymore. All right. 
Um, and then in here, we're going to need to get rid of all the static keywords. Oof. There's 25 of them. All right. And... These are just type defs. They can remain here. Register component type, grant entity. Yep. All these API calls will still function where they are. We'll worry about splitting them off later. Yeah, actually everything else in the header can stay the same. All right. Um, this is also a super simple header. Um, let's take a look at the CPP file. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so for starters, we can change the scope to be EP uh, scene manager. Like that. Um, and then these items, DCFs, QCFs. Oh, actually, no, these can remain static. Okay, that's fine. Cool. We've got some private state. Um, so we've got the entity struct, which is only useful inside of this file. Um, a pool made from the things. Actually, this, despite the size of this file, it's looking like we haven't broken anything at all. Because um, almost everything in here is private state to the CPP file. So we may need to move things to the private header as we split this off into other CBB files, but it's kind of looking fine. I mean, yeah, okay. I think that's actually okay out of the box, which is great. Um, state manager is going to be probably way simpler. Um, let's take a look at it. State manager.h. All right. All right. So on this one, we'll just roll it into its own namespace. Get rid of the public keyword down at the bottom. Where we would have done uh, a private section, we're just going to break off the namespace. Like that, um, we don't have we don't do friends anymore, uh, and these private entities need to go or these private members need to go into a private header, which we'll add now. This stuff, yeah, we'll need to include the core header with this. There we go. Um, that should give us the EP API and other stuff. We'll also need actually, these can be pre populated by CMake, so that's fine. Um, and to get rid of these squiggles, I'll need to add the private header to CMake lists. Okay. 
like that. Cool, configuring is done. And now all these symbols are resolving. Um, yeah, these don't need to be static anymore. Same thing for these. Um, okay, none of these need to be static. Whew. that leave us. Um, so we've got the uh, state class, which is good. Um, so when you go to create a state, it'll be an EP state manager state. Um, and you can, now that it's part, part of a namespace, you can just say using EP state manager state and then uh, not have to do the state manager colon colon state part. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's looking good. Um, the uh, the creation, the typical creation code for a state for the global state machine is templated, um, so that's all in here. Um, push existing state, insert state. And then on the state manager private, we will do include uh, enterprise state manager .h um, to get us access to state. So that's good. Okay, this is looking pretty good. Um, So we've gone through all of the basic system headers. Oh, we haven't gone through the time system yet. Let's do time. Okay. Uh, so we'll change this to a namespace. Namespace time. Uh, there's no public access modifier anymore. There's no friends anymore. Um, and this stuff needs to go into a private header. So let's add that now. Cool. And then we will cut all of this, paste it into here put it in the namespace uh, EP time. Like that. Oops. And static. Okay, now all of the public API stuff is looking pretty slick. Um, right now we have a constants um, section up here as well, but we'll come back to that. Eventually this is going to be resource compiled, but for now we're just doing constants at the top of the header. Um, good, 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 good. Uh, UN64T is undefined. Um, yeah, at some point I must have included, um, I forget, I think it's like uh, type, uh, or sorry, SD, it is SDD end, okay. At some point I must have included this header in one of my other headers without remembering it. So it's in scene editor state.h. 
Huh. Because I don't think I added it to my um, pre-compiled headers. Yeah, I, I don't know how or why I've made it this whole time doing uint 64 t types without including this header anywhere. Uh, did it, do I include a std int somewhere? Like the regular std int? No, I guess not. Uh, so yeah, let me go ahead and re go ahead and add uh, cstd int to my precompile headers. Uh, So, I pretty much only use precompile headers um, in this engine for uh, standard library stuff. Um, so this is C, C standard library, and then this is um, regular, sta regular standard library, C++ standard library. And this this is uh, the only thing that I put everywhere, pretty print, because I want pretty prints to be um, used for all the container types from the uh, standard library. Uh, Alright. Back to where we were. Uh, time private .h, uh, let's go ahead and add it to CMake lists. Oh, hang on. The fact that I didn't add time private .h to CMake lists is the reason why it's not linking to this, not the other way around. Okay, I can actually leave that out. Um, here we go. Uh, so inside the engine source section, we will now add uh, time underscore private .h. Okay, and that should start the resolving those squiggles. Cool. So ep time in it. Uh, platform in that. Get rid of all the static business in this file. Okay. Um, good, good. Good. And then inside of time.cbp, we need to include that private header. To resolve all these. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to be inside of the time namespace now. Um, and then every instance of time colon colon in this file, probably, probably most of them. Except for that one warning. And instead of constants, time. Yeah, so we can change most of these, or remove most, most of these. So let's start here. And then within this selection, remove all time. Good. 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 All right. That should be all better now. Save. Um, I think that's it for the headers. Um, we probably have broken a whole bunch of stuff in, <laughs> in pursuit of this refactor. Um, like, yeah, look at this time, the time uh, platform specific CPP files now all need to be changed as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and you know, close out these, these source files. I'm going to try a build and then have that failure enumerate 
all the places that I need to fix. Yeah, so we should be seeing a whole bunch of problems. This is a very useful technique, by the way, is to let the compiler like bre break something and then let the compiler tell you where where the problem is. Um, okay, use some undeclared identifier callback pointers. Callback pointers is a it was a private member of the enterprise or the enterprise events class. Now it is part of the private header. So we need to include um, Oh, hang on, that's going to be a little confusing, isn't it? So... Alright, so this is the events.h header. Um, the problem is that I want inside of the inside of the dispatch, which is templated, so it has to be inside of a header, I was trying to access a private member of events. Um, yeah, I use that technique all the time, just press F5. Yeah, it's, it's helpful. Uh, for me, I just I'll periodically just press F7 and make sure that everything's still compiling. Um, in this case, though, I'm just letting the compiler tell me what I need to chase down, um, knowing full well that I've got over a hundred problems. Um, there's probably more that's not in this list because I have to resolve some of these others to see them. Um, but yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, so uh, when you do a data event in my event system, uh, if we go to I'll, I'll pull up some example code. Uh, for example, uh, normally what you would do if you like had an integer that that um, contained like the value of five or whatever, and you want to pass pass that data to another place in the engine, what you would normally do is you go at EP events uh, dispatch and then pass in the name of the event. So this would be uh, event name, uh, and then the data you would pass in as a templated. Uh, second parameter. Um, so I could either just pass in the five or I could pass in value or whatever. Um, and the way that this would work is it would infer the templated parameter type int and just pass that data to the event name. And then on the other end, when you go to handle this event, you can just use uh, EP events unpack, tell it that you want to get an int out of whatever it is, and then yeah. And, and it makes it real simple to pass data around. Now uh, the trouble is the, the trouble that I'm dealing with now is that uh, in order for that to work, uh, I need this to be templated. I need it to be in the header, and this needs to have access to callback pointers, which is it was a private member of the events system class, uh, but we've changed it to a namespace now. So this is now living inside of the private header that we don't want to expose. You know what? I think I might have a solution for this. This might not require much thinking at all. So there is a generic dispatch here um, where you tell it the type uh, and it just sends off a basic event without a data payload. Um, and you can see that this functionality actually kind, kind of lines up. So what I might be able to do is I might be able to like wrap up this logic in here somewhere. Do I have a dispatch for pre-existing events? I do. Okay, so there's actually a on the on the implementation side here. Um, we've got a function that that takes you create the event class um, and then you just pass it to uh, this function and it sends it off. So what I could do is I could just because if this is you know, I think this is literally the same code. Is it literally the same code? It is. It's literally the same code. It's just, yeah. So what I could do is I could just replace this whole thing with um, a call to events dispatch. Passing in e, the event that we created up above. Um, if you have a unique hash name, uh, would you, would you, could use some type erasure? If, if you would have unique hash name, would you? I'm not sure that I'm following your question. Type erasure. Um, if, if you're if you're asking the question, I think you are. Um, the uh, 
it, it is you can run into a situation where you're accidentally uh, unpacking the wrong data type, but I have an assertion protecting against that. Um, so like if you try to uh, take a mouse move event, for example, um, and then you try to extract like a string out of it instead of the vector two that's your mouse position, uh, that'll cause an asser assertion to trigger. Um, so you'll never ever accidentally do that in shipping code. Um, presumably. That's alright. Um, but yeah, so like the, I, I think the term type erasure might mean something that I don't really remember. Um, here we go, type erasure. It's the load time process by which type annotations are removed from a program uh, before it's executed at runtime. Yeah, um, maybe maybe you're asking on the C++ side. Because it's templated, the dis dispatch method um, is templated, um, it'll it'll only uh, implement a version of, of this dispatch for any types that you actually used in your code. So it's not type erasure, it's just um, that it's never compiled in the first place if you don't use it. Does that make sense? Uh, so we don't we don't need to do any casting to void pointers or anything like that. It just uh, the template will automatically handle the uh, um, the correct type, and then on the unpack method down here, uh, we do a dynamic cast to make sure that it's the right type. The templates were one that took me a very a surprisingly long time to actually get into trying to use. Um, but yeah, they're uh, a lot better now. Uh, they're a lot. They're the, it's once once you once you've actually used them, like wrote, wrote a number of your own templates, they become like way easier to understand. And I don't know why I waited so long to learn how to use them. I don't. They're just they're helpful. Um, so we still got an error here. Oh, the error squiggle is going to remain until I try to recompile. Okay. So. Uh, this actually is probably just a simple fix. Let's hit F7 on that. We still have some error squiggles in here, though, in events.cpp, but we'll come back to that. Okay, yeah, that, that error has gone away, um, so we'll move on to the next one. We'll take care of all the headers first, and then we'll move on to the cpp files. Um, unknown type hash name. So this is the command line options header. Um, that's because we haven't included um, we haven't included uh, enterprise hash name uh, core hash names. Um, this itself is a core header, so I don't just include enterprise core here because that would be a circular dependency. Um, I am including the specific core feature I need, which is hash names. Okay. File.h, uh, redefinition as a file as a different kind of symbol. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I'm a little confused by that. This suggests that there was a different, uh, a different file class somewhere else in here. But this, we've just got standard library stuff up here. So I don't get it. I guess we'll come back to that. Well, that's weird. I've included hash names. So it should know what a hash name is, but I'm still getting that error. F7 again.
Okay, so that did resolve. All right. Uh, curse of position. Use of undeclared identifier. Curse of position. All right. So this input dot h. Uh, curse of position. I think was a private uh, member. Yeah. So uh, this is a declared and used inside of input private. Um, I was using a getter. I was doing an inline getter for curse, for mouse position. Okay, so that's going to have to change to no longer be inline. It's not great, but um, we're going to need to move this to the implementation. Um, so that way we can have the uh, mouse position be shared state. Um, and then uh, still be able to access it without <clears throat> without including the shared state header. So we'll put this underneath get access down here. Um, and the prototype was GLM vec2. CMD options. That's weird. It's complaining again about hash name. There's no good reason I can think of why hash names would be would still be invisible to this header. Perhaps the issue is arising from one specific configuration. Now this is pretty unconditional, it's just a UNT64T. I'll put that on the back burner from for the moment. And we've also got the return of this this warning from file. Ah, whatever. Oh, this is where okay. Hang on, what's this? Runtime.h. Uh, I still have runtime.h friending these classes that don't, don't exist. So maybe that's where the redefinition error comes from. Because it's expecting it to be a class. I'll try removing those and recompiling. CMD line options. Non-static declaration of CMD line options follows static declaration. Okay, let's take a look at the CMD line options. H. Inside of the uh, private header for command line options, I have these still declaring as static. They should just be extern. Same thing goes for the method. Um, no longer needs to be static. 
Um, and then down in here, uh, this can be defined, uh, can be the extern definition. Yeah, that should probably be fine. It is starting to get unpleasantly warm. Redefinition of CMD option help registry. Because I forgot to mark it X turn. That's right. Do that again. Now we're under the uh, implementation files, it looks like. for So this is the file Win32. So this is the Windows-specific file system stuff. Um, yeah, the first problem is that I, I haven't done the file namespace wrapper yet. OK. Um, and so I can get rid of file colon colon for the most part. as well. Understand this, the unknown type hash name. That's if you just go into the one header that the file has, it's got a type def right there. If I literally copy and paste it, well, that would be a duplicate definition, but I'll ignore that for now. Um, state manager active state. No member named active state in namespace EP state manager. Okay. So this is the events.cpp. Um, we need to have that private stuff brought in. So we'll go to, um, it would be state manager slash state manager private IH. That actually should resolve most of these errors in this file. And we're getting close. I'm at three hours and 40 minutes or something. Um, let's see if we can't finish this in the next 15 minutes. It's actually probably not a far ways off. Okay. Uh, so that resolved the warnings, or the errors, but I don't... Extra qualification on member. Oh, I can get rid of um, events colon colon from a lot of these. Actually, from all of these, that's surprising. Do I not have any warnings in here?
Yeah, I guess, guess not. Recompile, see if those compiler warnings disappear. And they do. Cool. All right. Redefinition of content der path. That sounds to me like I forgot to mark an extern. I'm still gonna file private.h. Yeah, these need to be all marked extern. Register command line option uh, is no longer part of runtime. Let me, uh, I can probably just control, search, control C and then search the whole thing. Runtime register command line option from the entire project and just replace it with register command line option. Same thing with check command line option. There's also get command line option. Oh, that's cool. I uh, didn't notice this, but apparently I've got a 50th follower at some point. Did it pop? Did that happen during this stream, or did that happen? Oh wow, that happened. Uh... Oh, it was the bot. <laughs> Way earlier when the bot uh, messaged and uh, said, "Hey, do you want to get followers or whatever?" All right, whatever. Small victories. Technically made it to 50 followers, but it's. Uh... It was a bot that did it. Okay, so that resolved all the other squiggles except for Runtime is Editor, which was a private member of Runtime. Oh, we haven't... We haven't fixed that yet. Okay, so is running was a uh, private member of the Runtime class. We, we check it when we want to know whether the uh, thing is set to run. Um, this needs to be moved to a private, a private member outside of the class. Uh, I'll come back to it in a minute because I haven't really decided how I want to handle um, runtime state that shouldn't be part of the instance of the runtime. Um, because I need that to be like. It would make sense for it to be a static member of the class, but I need that to be private, so that way it's not available everywhere. Um, I might have to do friends, um, friend declarations from runtime to make that variable hidden, but I'll, I'll deal with it later. Okay, no member named fbwits in namespace graphics. Okay, um, fbwits and fbheights are the uh, they're the maps from the frame buffer handles to their associated widths and heights. Um, that was a private implementation detail, but it needed to be shared across multiple files. So that should be inside of the private frame buffers header now, or the private graphics header now.
from there. Okay, it seems to be link it seems to be finding the symbols now. Okay, and then the rest of this seems to also be um, solved by the inclusion. So let's do F7. So a lot of these errors have gone away now. Um, however, we got a redefinition error now. Um, so that tells me that I forgot to mark this X term. So go to graphics, privates.h. I did, I forgot to mark these X, X term. Um, and these will need to be marked X term as well. Let me just do that now. I don't think I'm going to be done in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, and that seems to have resolved the remaining errors in frame buffers not CPP. So let's go back to the list. Um, all right. Oh no, there are more errors. There's, um, right, runtime run is running. That's the one that we, we're gonna skip over for the moment. Okay, um, in frame buffers, sorry, in shaders.cpp, we have uh, error, no member named, selected shader name. Uh, so these were private members of the graphics class. That's no longer the case. Um, so yeah, we haven't actually gone in. Have I? Yeah, I haven't even changed. I haven't even scoped correctly in framebuffers.cpp. Let's do that now. Um, <sighs> okay, and then uh, all the graphics prefixes in this file. We can probably get rid of most of them. That should be scoped correctly. And then shaders.cpp will do the same thing. Because shaders.cpp is where the GLSL pre-parser lives, or pre-processor lives, um, there's going to be a lot more error messages than most files. Because there's a whole bunch of conditions that I need to report where pre-processing went wrong.
So everything should be scoped correctly in this file now. Uh, we just have to deal with some of these other errors. Um, the We need to include the private header. Um, and let's compile that. <clears throat> okay, so that resolved these errors up top. And actually the rest of the file seems to be doing all right, so that's good. And heading back to the compilation errors list, um, INI reader is trying to use is alphanumeric, which is probably a bad name for that function. It's a private helper function of the file system. Uh, so let's change that. So we're including the, the private file header. extra scope modifiers to the file system, because we're in the file namespace now. Um, yeah, that's probably all we need to do. Let's compile that, see if the error goes away. And then we've got to do the same thing for INI Writer, which is a separate file from INI Reader. Okay. Okay. And then we can get rid of a lot of these file scope things. Yeah. Actually, we can just get rid of all of them because they're not... We don't use file colon colon in the uh, error messages or the warning messages. Um, yeah, and all these warnings are from the use of alphanumeric, which should be fixed now. Ugh. There we go, all the red marks have gone away, and we're done with that file. Um, okay, inside of shaders.cpp, cannot define or redeclare active shader program. Uh, because here, because namespace graphics does not enclose namespace OGL. Oh, okay. So um, on these, because OGL is not part, is not a child of graphics or EP, um, I have to actually do colon colon to go to the global namespace and then move my, move my way out. Um, yeah, because if I go to the OpenGL header, um, this is where all, all my OpenGL helper stuff lives, um, I have a namespace EP OP, OG, OGL, and that's for you know, enterprise OpenGL stuff. Um, and in here, uh, we are defining Active Shader Program um, inside of OGL, inside of graphics, and that's not where the OGL namespace was. It was outside of it. So um, in this file, when we go to use uh, OGL, we actually have to do uh, colon colon EP colon colon OGL colon colon. Um, a little wordy, but I 
I suppose I could put these details inside of um, an OGL.CPP, OpenGL.CPP, but I'll have to revisit that idea. Yeah, or I could do an, an alias, you're right, to eliminate that need. But right now my, my focus is not on making everything readable. <laughs> it's just getting it to compile and then I'll worry about making the space. Yeah, the, the uh, namespace OGL equals EP. Yeah, I could use an alias um, and I may choose to do that. But for now, my goal is to just get everything to compile um, and then I'll move my way uh, back to readability. Um, now that I'm going with the namespace approach for the systems, I think it probably will make more sense for me to, to do a opengl.cpp um, and include all the opengl uh, related stuff in there. Um, or actually, you know what would make more sense? Let me undo that change. What would make more sense is for me to put the OGL uh, namespace inside of the graphics namespace. Like that. Um, because that's the only context in which I'm going to want to use it, I think. I'm just going to quickly gut check myself though, see um, if there's any files in which I am using OGL colon colon, that's not a graphics location. Yeah, all of them are in the graphics system. Frame buffers, shaders, textures, uniform buffers, and all that. So I'm um, just gonna put it inside of the EP graphics OGL namespace, and then that'll make it play nice with all the locations it's gonna live. I haven't moved textures.cpp into scope yet. So there's some errors there. But looking back at shaders where we were working. Kind of looks like we're done with OpenGL related errors now. Um, so it looks like all of these, all of these um, issues that we're seeing inside of shaders.cpp are from the uh, runtime static members that are no longer static members, or that are no longer available because this is not, not a part of the private friend class. Okay, file colon colon shaders headers path. That needs to come in from the private file header. So let's include that. File slash file private dot h. Um, yeah, every single one of these other errors, and there's a lot of them, um, they are from the runtime private members that we haven't decided how to address yet, so I'm going to skip over them. But yeah. Okay. Uh, inside of textures.cpp, we got the OGL error here, use of undeclared declared identifier. And that's because we have to do a few things. We have to do, do the uh, graphics namespace wrapping. Oh, 
Oh, whoops. I made some changes that I didn't mean to. Um, there's some folded stuff in here. Unfold all. Okay. I was doing some range-based um, search and replace, and the, I screwed up because some of the stuff was folded, and I wasn't seeing some of the elements inside the range that I was replacing. Okay. So that should be all the sculpting stuff I need to worry about, um, and now I need to make sure that I've got the OpenGL. That, that should be fine. F7. Yeah, we're at four hours and five minutes now. I may need to hop offline and then either wrap this off wrap this up off camera or come back to it tomorrow. Okay, use of undeclared identifier active shader name. That comes from the private graphics header. Looks like that's uh, similar for the best of this as well. Looks like we got all the red squigglies out of this file, um, which is a little confusing. I thought that I would have a few left. Yeah, okay, there's a few. Uh, runtime is editor and runtime is running. But apart from that, this file is good to go. So let's move on. Similar scoping issue with uh, uniform buffers.cpp. Refactor is tedious but necessary. I think you do a good job of making the code better for future use. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this is uh, this is a, this is something that I would totally just never come back to if I didn't have to. But I'll, it, it'll make it'll make the whole rest of the project so much easier. Maybe graphics, and then I can get rid of the graphics scoping. For the most part, What I would love, I would love there to be like keyboard shortcuts inside of VS Code here for me to be able to switch from skipping, replacing, and replacing. Because as it is, they're, they both just use the enter key and they're context specific. So like if I have this in focus and I press enter, it will um, 
skip, and if I have this in focus, it'll, or sorry, this will replace, this will skip. And it's kind of, a, kind of, well, hang on a moment. Maybe I can make that work. Let's try that out. So, okay, so it's, oh, okay, okay, I've got a plan. I've got a way to make this a little bit faster. Um, okay, so what we'll do is we'll tab down to here to replace and tab up and enter to skip. Okay, marginally faster, <laughs> but still a bit tedious. You replace all graphics to uh, graphics underscore. Um, no, because this is the implementation file. I would also have to make those changes to the header file, and I don't want to be changing the names of all my types. I just want to get the scoping out. Okay, that seems to be where I need it. Um, and now that we're inside of the correct namespace, the OpenGL stuff should be pulling in as well. Um, oh, you oh the you meant the quotes to be part of the search term. Um, oh, you're right. That would have been that 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 would be helpful. Um, because then I could uh. Uh, quickly replace all of the colon colon, then go back and replace and yeah, I see what you're saying. That that would certainly be a smart way to do it. And I might do that going forward. Um, I need the private header in here. Hit F7. And everything should be largely better. I should be seeing some errors still in this file regarding runtime, I think, but that's about it. Yeah, so there's the warnings. Um, <clears throat> the errors for runtime as editor being inaccessible. Um, which we already know and we'll worry about later. Uh, cool. Okay, now we're into vertex arrays. So we'll need to do the scoping thing in here as well. And I'm going to try out that trick that you suggested. I think that that's going to be a pretty smart way to address this. Because yeah, every, every time I have a warning message, it'll start with a quote. All right, and then from here, I can do graphics colon colon. And every single one of these should be valid replacement material. Yep. You is smart. And then I can do the replacement on graphics underscore with graphics colon colon. Beautiful. That was an awesome suggestion. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I actually have never used the compile active file feature before. I'm wondering whether that would be saving me some time when I'm checking these individual files. Because when I do it hit F7, it tries to rebuild everything. Um, 
that might be might be unnecessary for cutting down on the errors that I'm trying to cut down on. No, thank you. What's up? You know what's up. Okay. And then in the window win32.cpp, we're trying to access graphics, resize, variable widths with F FBs, and that's now a private member. So we need to add include graphics slash graphics private.h. Let's try just hitting compile active file, and maybe that'll. So it generated some. It generated uh, in, the, in the terminal. It generated and showed the errors from compiling. It didn't actually remove the error from the text editor, which is what I wanted it to. So I guess I'm gonna have to keep hitting F7 for it to do that. The error squiggles are still there until I hit F7 to rebuild. That's annoying, but whatever. Okay, now the squiggles got away. Okay, that's pretty good. We're down to 62. <laughs> it keeps going up. Uh, the error the air count goes has been hovering around 100 for a while now. Um, now we're down to 62. Um, Redeclaration. What's this? Callback pointers. Oh, hang on. I forgot to mark this as extern, I think. Uh, so this will be in state manager private. Yeah, these need to be extern. Um, and I'm pretty sure we take away the EP API bit, and then we apply that to Yeah, we apply EP API to the state list and active list. I'm actually not sure about that. My brain's turned to putty. Um, I think I'll subject myself to another 15 minutes of this <laughs> and then uh, hop off stream and then worry about this later. Um, but we're most of the way through the refactor at this point. We're just cleaning up. Some of the things that I broke. Um, yeah, so with state manager, state list, and these guys, um, I'm trying to figure out in my head whether the extern declaration needs to be marked as an ex exported symbol. Uh, I don't think that it does. I think that it's supposed to be extern, and then it just looks inside into an, another translation unit using the extern uh, keyword. And then when we load the DLL via EP API, uh, it would just, the extern would locate that symbol and then use it. I think that's how that works. But I'll leave it like this for now, and if that doesn't work, then I'll come back and worry about it later. But um, at the very least, we can get rid of the double declaration error. Let's try that again. Okay. 
Okay, this needs the uh, state manager private header. EP input has no member platform in it. Uh, right. So this is going to require including enterprise slash. Oh, sorry. It'll be including input slash input private dot h um, in order to gain access to that symbol. Uh, and we're going to do the namespace. Getting rid of all those scopes. And in this case, we don't have any uh, error messages or warnings that use input colon colon, so we can just search and replace all of them with blank text. All right, there's seven on that. Now we're back up to 79 problems. Uh. Redeclarations should not. Redeclaration of callback pointers should not add DLL export attribute. Uh, okay, yeah, so I guess then we'll have to do the DLL export on header file then. So on this guy, you would see EP API next turn, like so. And we have a redefinition error in a few places in input.cpp. So if we go to input private.h, I didn't need I need to mark a few things next turn that I forgot to. Um, current buffer needs to be marked next turn. Um, context definition re registry. Yeah, these things need to be marked as next turn. So and we need access to the state manager private variable active state. So we need to uncomment these includes now. All right, let's hit F7, see how that turns out. Okay, now we're down to 52. Um, all right. A lot of these are errors with the access to the is editor and is running. 
Okay. And then here we've got uh, access issues to file in it, input in it, graphics in it, time in it, and all this. These are the core calls of these systems. They used to be private member functions. Uh, now they are simply hidden in the private header. So I need to include, uh, for all of these systems, I need to include their private versions. Um, in fact, I may not even need their public versions. I might only need their private versions. Yeah, I think that's the case. So um, when I would do uh, time file input and all that stuff, uh, I would do something like this. And include their private versions of their headers instead. And I'll do the same thing for C manager and state manager. giving it another five minutes before I uh, end the stream and worry about this later. Okay. Um, that seemed to work pretty well, except for, interestingly, the events editor play cleanup and events cleanup I'm getting warnings that they that they're not in the events namespace, so I must have screwed up in events.cbp. No, they're here. Maybe I screwed up in the events header. Yeah, I don't really understand. EP events, this is the namespace. We've got editor play cleanup and then cleanup. Oh, maybe I forgot to add core private. private, private. Huh. At some point, I must have accidentally removed the. Uh, events header. Okay, that resolved that. Now we're down to 38, <laughs> 38 issues. Okay, so in game module dynamic, um, we are trying to access file content to your path without the private file header. Let's add that. And that probably will resolve most to all of these. Yeah, it's looking good. Um, okay. A lot of those red squigglies have gone away. Most of the remaining errors are his editor and his running scope problems, so we'll put that on the back burner for now. Um, there is a uh, problem with EP time. EP time has no member platform in it. That's because I need to include time 
slash time private. And that leaves us with this one perplexing issue of hash name, type hash name not no. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So this is a, a these declarations exist in all versions of the enterprise library. as does type def un64t hash name. Oh, I've got myself a circular dependency in here. Hash names includes core, which includes hash names. I wonder how long that's been so. I don't know if this is causing that problem, but it would be a problem. probably go back into all of my headers and make sure that uh, I'm using pragma once and then all the new headers because I've I remember I forgot if, forgot those in a few yeah, I forgot it in this one We're down to 24 errors now, by the way. Um, so we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, I said that I would be wrapping up. I think I am pretty much done. I'm just gonna quickly recompile. Hey, Goku, welcome in. You caught me at the very, very end of the stream. <laughs> I was in the middle of doing, um, on my game engine, doing an inspector view and ran into a problem that really would have been easy to fix if I solved some te tech debt that I've been passing down the road. So uh, here I am in the middle of a major refactor. Almost done though. Close all these windows for now. <laughs> Can I see your game engine? Sure. Uh, right now it's not, uh, it's, it's, we're in the middle of a major refactor, so we're resolving all the problems that's preventing it from compiling. Uh, but yeah, if, if you check out one of my VODs, um, we're working on it, and we've got some colors and stuff on the screen. It's also available um, on GitHub. 
<laughs> Yay, we have 50 followers. Oh, thanks for the thanks for the follow. I didn't uh, get the ding in my ear to say that I got a new follow. Okay, um, we are in very good shape now. Look at this, down to 16 problems. Um, so all of the actual compilation errors are from the is editor and is running uh, variables that we have to figure out a way to scope. Um, the rest of this is just warnings. Uh, let's see, your function has internal language but is not defined. Um, Command line options.cpp should have this, shouldn't it? Oh, I forgot to get rid of the static keyword. Whoops. All right, let's remove all those. Bam. Um, and there's nine of these here, but that's only because there's uh, these these are included in three different projects. Um, so three three projects failed to or pr produce that warning for each of them. So that should resolve the warnings. Um, now, if we we have one more thing we have to resolve before this will compile, and that is what to do about uh, public access to static bool is running and static bool is editor. Um, it makes a lot of sense for these to be static members of this class, which we actually instantiate. Um, but can we instantiate it as a singleton as well. But I guess we're going to need to expose this outside of the class um, in a in a private header. So I'm going to go ahead and just do kind of hack together uh, the solution here. I'm going to need to come up with a better solution going forward. But I'm going to add a header uh, called runtime underscore private, um, and that's going to include these members. Um, and that way, I can include that header in the select few places that actually use it. Yeah. So um, let's at least get it to compile before I move on. How do I access it? Presently, you uh, presently because it's a work in project. Project. <laughs> sorry, because it's a work in process. Um, progress. You have to build it yourself. So if you go to that link, that's in the in the uh, in the uh, chat. Yeah, you downloaded it. The README will show you how to compile it, um, but you do need to be able to use CMake. Um, there's not a, there's not a CMake tutorial there, but if you if you Google a CMake tutorial, um, it'll show you how to build it. Not much to look at quite yet. We've just we're working on the editor stuff now. Um, but there's a lot of runtime library stuff available if you're C++ -y. Okay, so let's um, Yeah. So inside of the source folder then, underneath runtime, I'm going to add a new file. This will be runtime private .h. once and then in here we will add elements that uh, were formerly private members of the runtime class. Um, so I'll do EP as the namespace. Um, again runtime is still going to be a class so we're, we're not scoping the EP runtime we're just doing EP. Um, and then inside of here I will cut this out and this out. I think these are the only two things that we try, we try to access in other areas of code. Um, and then instead of making these static, because that's not how this works, we make this external with a T. There we go. External is running, is editor, etc. All right, and then We'll need to add a CPP file as well. Actually, just in the CPP file, we would uh, remove that scope 
and then that's good to go. Cool. Now I just need to add runtime private dot h to the build. Yeah, thanks, Goku. Yeah, it's uh it, it is pretty it, it is gonna be pretty cool. I am I'm not quite to the point where I'm I'm really proud to show it off yet, but we've got to the point where we're starting to put um starting to be able to construct scenes in an editor, and that's a huge milestone. So I need to include the private editor now. Uh this guy. Um to get these. And then in CMake lists for the engine, we need to add source runtime, runtime underscore um, uh, private dot h. Bam. Okay. That seems to have generated CMake fine. And uh, now in any of the places that we were running into this error, we now also need to include the private runtime header. Um, so enterprise slash, or sorry, runtime slash runtime private. Cool. So let's go through these files quickly and add that uh, here. Let's file. Shaders needs it. Um, textures needs it. Uniform buffers needs it. And input needs it. Huh, okay. Um, moment of truth time, F7. Let's see if this all builds correctly. If it does build correctly, there's a good chance that it'll have runtime linking errors with the DLL, uh, but we'll see. Okay, what do we got? Got a bunch of... Okay, no member named is editor AP runtime. Oh, because now it's not in... Yeah. So every instance of runtime is editor needs to just be replaced with uh, is editor. And the same thing goes for runtime is running. Because now they're moved out of the class scope and into the into the EP names namespace. Yeah, eventually at some point, Goku. Um, eventually at some point, I'll have a binary distribution of the of the engine available, so you can just like install it the way that you would Unreal or Unity. Um, we're we're not quite there yet. We need to get the get an MVP working on the editor before we can look at distributing it, putting a game engine and stuff. That is right. <laughs> you can say that again. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I really started this like a couple of years ago, and it's all, only been a back burner item for me. But now I've been really spending a lot of time on it, and I think we're almost to the point where it can do some cool things. But there's a whole bunch of boilerplate that you have to deal with. Okay, so instead of working, <laughs> everything broke. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Identifier is editor is undefined. Okay. Are there it looks like there's a bunch of files now that I didn't add the private runtime to. That wasn't showing up in my previous error lists. Oh. Alright, I'll give it two more minutes. Now that we're on a different 
a different problem and we're nearly done with making it compile. I'll see if I can just pound this out in another 15 minutes or something. Runtime uh, slash runtime private dot h. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So let's collapse all on these files. Um, I will add to each of them the private runtime header. Ugh. see manages the last one. Bam. All right, F7. <laughs> be real great if it worked. Okay, we've got some scoping problems inside of cmanager.cpp. Um, so I'm gonna use that trick from earlier, where we replace scene manager colon colon uh, whenever it's start start of a string with cmanager underscore, and then I can find and replace all of the legit cmanager colon colon scopes with empty text. And go back to colon colon on the warning and error messages that include that text. All right. Um, all of the reported errors were from this file though, so we're, I think we're nearly done. Use Windows 11. How do you enjoy Windows 11? Okay. Uh, remaining problems in when in runtime CPP. I haven't. I just haven't bothered to look into it yet. <laughs> I'm. I'm. I'm still at home on Windows 10. Um, but I'm glad to hear it's doing well. My hardware's aging a little bit as well, so I'm not sure that I would even be able to run Windows 10 effect or Windows 11 effectively. Um. Oh. Oh. I think. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, so this error here, th these problems are arising because I forgot the, the fundamental place where I need to have the private members available, and that's inside of runtime.cpp. So runtime the, pro the runtime private header, I forgot to put that in the place where we define all that stuff. So this should be it. OK, it turned out I was wrong again. <laughs> Got more errors. What's the problem now? How many files have we modified? Seventy seventy one. So it's probably probably like eighty files, not counting the test game project. Okay. Use of undeclared identifier state list. What well, there's there's always one more thing, isn't there? Okay. So inside of state manager dot, dot h oh hang on, this might be a problem. 
uh, use of undeclared identifier, state list, and active state. Okay, so this is a similar situation to the issue we found with creating with the the templated uh, uh, the templated uh, dispatch on the event system. Uh, in that we have a templated function that requires access to private members, but that means that this has to be in the header, and it has to be in a header that doesn't include the the header that it needs to run. So we'll need to um, figure out a way to get this code offset somewhere. Um, so the way that we did that in the uh, event system is that we simply wrapped this code in a uh, function that's not templated. Um, and it looks like we can do the same thing here. We've got um, epapi void push existing state. So if you were to create a state um, and then pass it in yourself to push existing state, um, then you could yourself maintain a strong pointer to it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, inside of this templated state, um, we'll create the new state using um, std make shared. And then we will just pass it into push existing state, which should have similar code. Yeah, here. So this and this is literally the same, I think. Yeah. We just have slightly different names for the variables. So what we can do is we can clear that. Um, and then we would just call the push existing state on the new state. Um, and that should be enough. Let's try it. Yeah, I haven't really been talking with a lot of folks that have been using Windows 11. Most of my friends that are on Windows, they're still using Windows 10. So I don't really have a basis by which to guess how it's faring in the popularity contest. I think this might be it, guys. I'm not seeing any errors, knock on wood. Time was that that everybody I knew used to be Windows users, uh, but now I've got a significant uh, number of tech-related friends that are on uh, on uh, Mac OS. Mostly because they're um... yeah, booming time error. Yeah, this would be this would be a fun time to jump into one of those. And it looks like uh, we probably. Well, these are actually some warnings, so I've got some more problems to deal with. Okay, there it is, Link Timer. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, a lot of my uh, tech friends, they're also music-y, and they... Okay, uh, yeah, finish with Execute 1. We've got some problems. <laughs> uh, Redeclaration is one. Uh, so state list... So I've got first I gotta fix the scope. Uh, then I've gotta fix this business. Uh, duplicate declarations. I need to go into the private header. Um, into the private header. And these need to be marked EPAPI. 
API. All right, let's try that. Yeah, but it's like Mac. Mac, st Mac is like really popular for um, music and video editing um, still. So a lot of my friends who are into that stuff, they're also just gonna use it for the programming stuff. And frankly, it's not a bad place to program. I, I do, I do have a decent time with C++ stuff on Mac OS. It's just that the API is kind of require that you also know Objective C. All right, what do we got? Undefined symbol, private static void, e EP runtime prints command line help. I don't understand. Oh, I didn't move this out of the... Okay. So print command line help. Um, all of the command line API stuff used to be inside of runtime.h, inside of the, that, the private members of that class. Um, it looks like I moved it correctly to the private header and CPP file, but I didn't remove it from the private section of the uh, runtime header. So this should be accessing include runtime slash or um, core slash, what, what was the header location, CMD? It would be in core slash uh, cmd options private dot h. Okay. And then that should bring the symbol in from that header to be used inside of the runtime API call here. What a refactor. Refactoring is never fun, but something about this one is really giving me a headache. I don't have Max, can't say any oops, I put my mic. <laughs> I don't have Max, can't say anything about it except for it's expensive. Yes it is, you're right. Computers in general are expensive, Apple products are a tier above that. Um, for me, they, I, uh, I, when, I, when I'm on a desktop, I pretty much want it to be Windows. Um, I haven't tried Linux myself, but uh, for me the, MacBook is still one of the best laptop products out there. And that's my Mac as a MacBook, um, which I had purchased for things besides programming originally. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, the undefined symbol, private static class. Uh, or map, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah? I haven't, uh, I haven't myself looked into Alienware, but when I, whenever I'm looking into gaming hardware uh, for, like, gaming class PCs, I tend to just build my own, um, so I tend to just go straight to the source and look at graphics cards and uh, CPUs and things. Um, 
Though I guess I, I, I guess I shouldn't say that I'm like a PC builder because I've only built the one that I'm on right now. But um, I plan to build more in the future. But yeah, I've heard good things about Alienware for sure. EP runtime CMD line options. Okay. So there's maybe still a scoping problem. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I have... It looks like I've uh, copied out all this private stuff related to CMD, the CMD API, but uh, failed to delete it from the original header. So there was a duplicate declaration going on. Yeah, because that's all of this stuff here. CMD line options. Yeah, so what was happening was that um, inside of the runtime.cpp, uh, inside of that class's member functions, it was scoping to its member, uh, private members first, which were overriding the outer scoped CMD line options private. So that should be better, hopefully. I must have hit Control C when I meant to hit Control X when I was when I was cutting those over. Yeah, this uh, computer is, you know, it's still pretty good. It can it can do a lot of games. Um, indie games can still play very well, um, but for modern AAA blockbuster titles, it is really far behind. It's uh, running a GTX 970, um, which it wasn't even the best for its time when I got it. Um, I mean, obviously there was the 980, but I think the I got this almost almost directly before the 1070, 1080 came out. The 1080 was just amazingly better than the, 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 the 980. Um, I just never spent the money to upgrade. Okay, more problems. No member named CMD line options in runtime. Okay, so we're trying to access EP runtime on the entry point for the editor. Okay, so now we are officially outside of the scope of engine problems, it looks like. Oh, no, there is one left that's down here. Okay. Yeah, definitely got a migraine started though. <laughs> Doing all this. All right. So now I need the private uh, include uh, include runtime slash runtime private dot h and do the same thing for the other entry points. Okay, seems like those are all ready to go. All right, more problems. What are those? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I need, <laughs> I put the wrong header in. I need it to be core slash command line options private. Whoopsie. Undefined symbol, EP graphics, OGL, size OGL type. I forgot to mark an X turn. Oh wait, no, that's not right. This is a function. So that should be defined in um, I guess that would be in shaders, that's a creepy. No? OpenGL.cpp. Ah, okay. <laughs> Hopefully this is the last thing. Uh, that's what I said, the last three things. But uh, I had forgotten that I had moved the OGL namespace into the graphics namespace. And I just didn't do that for OpenGL.cpp. So I'm doing that now. And hopefully that's the last thing. Because I really need to stop. EP CMD line options missing from entry point 132. Undefined symbol. Should be defined here. Yeah, I'm not sure what the confusion's about. An ordered map to a hash name to a vector of strings. It's in the EP namespace. It's declared X turn. So I think, I think I've about hit my limit, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, terminate the stream. Um, we made quite a bit of progress 
the first several first couple of hours we got a solid game plan uh, working for uh, how we're going to approach uh, wrap around rotations in the editor when we're working on with Euler angles translating to and from the quaternions um, and then we got uh, most of the way through a refactor that'll make that code easy <laughs> um, and all future code after that easy I suppose um, but we're not quite there yet because I still got a couple of linker errors here and there'll be a little bit more refactoring to do after um, I have successfully moved all the core systems out of classes and into namespaces. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining me. Thanks for the new subs, or the new, um, sorry, follows. Follows on, on Twitch are free. Subs are the ones you buy. Um, I'm going to drink some water and get a nice pack on my forehead and take some ibuprofen because my brain is killing me. <laughs> take it easy. Thanks for jumping. Thanks for popping in.